Council is please stand. Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to elders past and present. Please be seated. Yes. Um, this computer um, is streaming. Thank you, Councillor. There you go. Thank you. I declare the meeting open and I remind all councillors of your obligations to declare material personal interests and conflict of interest where relevant and the requirement of such to remove yourself from the council chamber for debate and voting where applicable. Councillors, are there any apologies? There being none, confirmation of minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,599th meeting held on Tuesday the 13th of August 2019 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Second. It has been moved by Councillor Richards, seconded by Councillor Marks, that the minutes of the 4,599th meeting of Council held on the 13th of August 2019 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Councillors, today we have two public participants, the first of which is Mr Chris Boyle, and I'll call on him to address the chamber on ComSync's Domestic Violence Technology Solutions and Domestic Violence Prevention Action Group. Um, Mr Boyle, you will have five minutes, uh, and you can present standing or sitting, whichever you prefer. Um, and your, uh, the time begins when you begin. Thank you, Chair. Mr Chair, Lord Mayor and Councillors, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you this afternoon. Um, my name is Chris Boyle. I'm the CEO and co-founder of ComSync Foundation. Some of you may recognise us as winners of the 2019 Lord Mayor Global Entrepreneur Award, as well as the 2017 Lord Mayor Business Award finalist. It gives me great pleasure to come and speak to you here, and I was really excited to hear the announcement around the domestic violence strategy through this chamber and what we can do for the good people of Brisbane in response to the scourge, which is domestic violence. Our foundation was set up on the belief that domestic violence is preventable, yet it is the fastest growing crime across any postcode in Brisbane. It costs the economy $22 billion a year, and police receive a call every two minutes in response to domestic violence alone. There's something that we can do, though, to turn this tide. And I'm here to share with you the story of Jane. Jane lives not far from here. She lives with her two boys, aged 14 and seven. Jane is a lifelong victim of domestic violence and about five years ago lost an arm to an incident involving her ex-partner. Jane, like many other women, the million across Australia, reported, are told in response to domestic violence the same plan. Get to a phone, contact police, explain who you are, where you are, what's happening, and wait. Now, Jane knows that that plan doesn't work for her because we apply the Goldilocks principle where if Jane calls the police too early, there's nothing they can do. No crime has been committed. If Jane calls the police too early too often, Jane becomes a bit of a pain, draining resources. If Jane calls the police too late, then she often requires an ambulance as well. So Jane is expected in that moment of crisis to call just right, and that window closes like that. So Jane knows that that plan doesn't work, and so her boys, her 14-year-old son, has decided to sleep with a knife under his pillow to protect his mother, his brother and himself in the event that the ex-partner comes across. I met Jane about six months ago, and the discussion with her over the next three hours is, who in your life, Jane, knows the things that keep you up at night? She says, no one, because that's the isolation and that's the power of domestic violence. But what Jane forgets is that because no one knows doesn't mean that no one cares. So for the next three hours, we went through those people in her contacts, on her phones, on her photos, 
and said, who's that, who's that, who's that? She paused on Steve. And she said, oh, Steve once said he'd look after us, but he's busy, he's just bought a house, so I don't want to disturb him, she says. Jane, yours is not to answer on his behalf. Let's ask him, let's get him on the phone. Her heart's really racing now because she's checking in what she's worth. Is there anyone out there that would drop anything at any time to keep her safe? So we supported her to have a conversation with Steve, who said, of course, Jane, why didn't you tell me sooner? So Steve, what would you do if you got this call? You'll be able to listen in, you'll be able to make an informed choice, and you'll be able to escalate to emergency services, all within the space of a push of a button like this. So Jane now has tears of relief coming on her face because there are people out there who know and there are people out there who care. She's on a roll. She finds her neighbour, Renee, who also comes to her plan. And now they are the people who can respond anytime, any place. I've made a call to myself. This is Jane's call coming through. To confirm the alarm, press key. They said they would. We the so alarm, we make sure that they must accept this call to be able to be brought in. And now, I will just remove her entire network is able to get live audio about what's happening in her space. Understanding what's Steve is saying, Jane, you need to hear me. Jane, you need to hear me. To change the context, who's in, who's out. If it is that Jane is safe, they can knock on her door, they can call her phone. If it is that it's escalated, all they simply need to do the alarm has been triggered. Is press five on their keypad and we'll now bring in emergency services to conference call, giving her and her children the best response in the quickest possible time. No more waiting for Jane, no more Goldilocks for Jane and her boys. And I'm pleased to say this is, hello Jordana, I'm safe, uh, I'm at council, so thank you for joining. All right, thank you. Obviously I wasn't gonna disturb emergency services. That is our engineer, who's fantastic. She is joined in to keep us safe. And this is a world first, no one else is doing this. We've got the support of Optus, who we went through their Future Makers program. And we're very pleased that we're able to say that by asking you today is with your domestic violence strategy, if you contribute $25,000 to 25 children in Brisbane, Optus will match that funding and we can get 50 children with this solution on their wrist tomorrow to turn that curve. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Please be seated. Um, I will now ask for a member of uh, a chairman to respond to that, uh, Councillor Maddock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Boyle, thank you so much for coming in. My name's uh, Peter Maddock. I'm the councillor for Paddington Ward, um, and I'm also the chairman of our uh, Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee that uh, plays a large part in working with uh, organisations and government around the scourge. Um, your presentation has been um, tremendously touching and uh, I, I applaud you for uh, the innovation that you've shown. Um, so I, I'd like to say to you that um, we've all been inspired. In fact, the Lord Mayor has uh, just told me that he's more than happy to provide the $25,000 uh, towards uh, the, the technology that you're offering. Um, obviously, uh, the state government has a large role to play, but council also does as well. And working together with important organisations like yours to make a difference in people's lives, to provide the safety that every every woman and, and all their children rightly deserve, is absolutely at the forefront. So, uh, on behalf of the Lord Mayor and our administration, we, we're certainly behind you on this project. Um, I'll meet you outside afterwards, so we'll get my details to you, and then we can talk further about uh, how we get the money to you. Thank you. That, that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. We'll compliment. We've just been awarded $500,000 from the Commonwealth Government for women. So this will go specifically to children. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you, That's Mr. Wonderful. Boyle. Thank you very much. I would now uh, like to call on Ms Nicole Dyson, who will address the, address the Chamber on Future Anything's Social Entrepreneurship Program for high school students.
So, Ms Dyson, you, you have five minutes. You can stand or sit, whichever you prefer, and uh, your time will begin when you begin. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Mr Chair, Lord Mayor, councillors, thank you for having me today. Forgive me for reading. I'm more scared of that timer than I am of my mother. <laughs> My name is Nicole Dyson and above all things, I'm a passionate educator. As a teacher in, a, in Queensland for seven years, I've repeatedly led the design and implementation of whole school changes to support future ready learning designed by young people for young people. A couple of weeks ago actually marked two years since I stepped out of my head of department position in high schools. Now I'm the founder and director of Future Anything. Future Anything transforms young people's passion and curiosity into innovative ideas that make the world a better place. We're also a social enterprise. We put our profits into running programs in some of the world's most challenging communities. Last year, we traveled to Africa, working with 150 young people in Uganda to build dozens of youth-led enterprises. And then we funded the launch of five of those businesses run by young people in their communities. But let's be real. Entrepreneurship is the big thing at the moment. Everyone's either talking about it or doing it. We're a little bit different. Unlike other organizations, we work with the teaching teams within schools to run and embed a term-long, accessible, curriculum-aligned unit of work that culminates in each of our schools running their very own shark tank. Then, the best of the ideas pitched at these school shark tanks move through our national competition, where these students have the chance to secure the funding to launch their businesses. The first year we ran the program, it was 115 students in a single school. Then it was 303 schools. Last year, it was 700 students in five schools. This year, we've worked with 2,500 students across 20 schools. But let's not talk numbers. Let's talk about young people. Take Jordan, for example. Jordan launched his own mental health podcast called Mental Music, run by young people for young people. He amassed five other teenagers to work for him and also won the FYA's 2017 Rookie Enterprise of the Year Award, a national competition that saw him fly to Melbourne to accept that. Take Tristy and Lucy. They found it unacceptable in Australia that there are thousands of women and girls that don't have adequate access to sanitation. So they created the Dignify Project, selling fashionable pouches made out of recycled material, which was a one-for-one -one where each, uh, each pouch purchased funded sanitary items for a woman in need. Let's talk about Tanika. Tanika was bullied relentlessly at school, so much so that she contemplated taking her own life. Tanika is the founder of Shielded Socks, school socks, but not as you know it. These socks look like normal school socks above the shoe, so they meet the requirements of those pesky uniform policies. But underneath the shoe line, Tanika has partnered with local graffiti artists to create these epic designs. In this way, Tanika believes that it's under the surface that counts. She donates 10% of her profits to Headspace to support young people getting the support that they need. But every school entrepreneurship program has stories of amazing young people that have the potential to change the world. Future Anything is one of them. Brisbane-based 56 Creations has worked with over 50,000 young people. FYA's $20 Boss has worked with 15,000 young people in this year alone. That's just a couple of examples of the amazing work that's happening in Australia right now. The real challenge for us is how do we support these young people, regardless of how they come up with their ideas, to navigate life as an entrepreneur? Sadly, Mental Music and the Dignify Project have both folded their organisations, along with countless other youth-led businesses with potential that I could spend all afternoon talking to you about. These incredible young people don't fail because they, are, because they aren't passionate, resourceful or capable. They step away from their ideas because they feel that they have to choose between being a student and being an entrepreneur. Mr Chair, Lord Mayor, councillors, I'm not here today to ask for your support to get more entrepreneurship programs within your wards, although we can totally talk about that if you want to. <laughs> I'm here to ask you about how you would feel about Brisbane being the home of Australia's first national purpose-built accelerator designed especially for entrepreneurs that are still juggling school. Why should our young people wait until they finish high school or a four-year degree before they launch a business that could not only employ themselves, but others? Here at Future Anything, we're launching YouthX, designed and delivered in collaboration with educators at schools who understand what it's like to be a student and entrepreneurs who understand business and what it's like to be an entrepreneur. These young people will be supported with a combination of face-to-face -face workshops and online support, as well as personalized coaching with mentors. This way we can help them be an entrepreneur and a business owner, sorry, an entrepreneur and a student. At YouthX, we don't talk about ideas. Everybody's got an idea. We launch youth-led startups that bend the future. At YouthX, our young people aren't job seekers, they're job creators. 
Young people like Jordan, Tristy, Lucy and Tanika deserve the chance to see the potential of their ideas play out. I'd love to work with you to put Brisbane on the map as the only place for incredible young people to launch ideas that make their dreams come true. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms Dyson. Uh, Deputy Mayor, be seated. Thank Deputy you. Deputy Mayor will respond. And thanks, Nicole, for coming to speak this afternoon. I can see why you're scared of the five-minute clock, because uh, you've got so much passion. You could talk for hours about this, yes? Yes. Uh, as an ex-high school teacher myself, I can understand that passion, and I can see that you are really committed to what you are doing. It's a big step yourself, stepping out of the high school and into this space as well. I understand Tanika came and spoke at the Intergenerational Forum as well and yes. um, explained to everyone around her shielded socks idea, which mm. I think was... Uh, very uh, widely praised for the initiative that she had coming from her background and seeing at things that she could make a difference. Look, I love the idea that you're talking about. And I know you're talking to the economic development team. We do a lot in this space already for entrepreneurs, and we're just about to launch our fourth year of our four-year program with Elevate Plus. So yeah. I'd love the opportunity to see if there's any of your students that could step into that program to take them on that next steps of where they need to go um, to elevate their social enterprise ideas and how they create that business. We have had many students in that program. We've had students in the capital that we support as well. 256 startups there, and I can think of a couple of the, the students that have been coming in after school and using that space as well to collaborate and meet people with ideas, but probably more importantly, meet investors. This is one thing, it's the hardest thing I understand for entrepreneurs to come up and get that backing and that venture capital if it's a small, medium or large idea they have as well. The other program that we support is the um, Gen U. Uh, program, which is a five workshop program, particularly for students, probably a little bit older than your guys, 18 to 25 year olds, about how they prepare for business, how they get their CVs together, how they network, how they pitch to people. But that might be an idea for some of them as they leave school to look into that work program as well. As I said, we have the capital, we have space, we definitely have the motivation to be the social enterprise capital of Australia. And as I said, I know you're talking with the economic development team, so hopefully we can keep talking and see how we can support you into the future. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Dyson. Mr Piers will help you out. <laughs> Councillors, now begins question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or Chair of any Standing Committee? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Mr Chairman. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, this administration is delivering for the people of Forest Lake by ensuring its namesake lake remains an enjoyable landmark for all residents. Can you update the Chamber on Council's commitment to clean up Forest Lake? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Toomey, uh, and through you, Mr Chair. Uh, Forest Lake uh, is um, one of those parts of the city that is very unique, and uh, it's one of the few suburbs that is built entirely around a lake with a lake as its centrepiece. And, and of course, the suburb is named after that centrepiece lake. Um, and like any man-made lake, uh, Forest Lake, has had its issues. Lakes are uh, living, growing things and over time uh, can experience problems. Um, this lake uh, has many inlets um, and stormwater from the surrounding area, wildlife and various other things affect the lake. Um, and there have been uh, growing problems with uh, the water quality of the lake and also uh, with some of the wildlife uh, in and around the lake, particularly uh, the ibis population. And so uh, my predecessor, Lord Mayor Graham Quirk, announced that council would get on with a serious management plan to clean up the lake and do what is necessary to increase the water quality uh, and to deal with some of the issues that residents have been concerned about uh, and move forward with the investment that's required to make that happen. Uh, so I can announce today uh, that uh, from today, we will be releasing the strategic management plan for Forest Lake. It is a document that has been put together with the help of the experts in this kind of field. Uh, experts like Professor David Hamilton and Tony Weber, experts who have helped us develop a plan to improve Forest Lake, a plan to invest in Forest Lake to make sure that it is the asset 
that uh, the local community expects it to be uh, and is a true uh, great asset for that community. Now, uh, the lake has suffered from issues like uh, algae, algae blooms, um, and also I mentioned the um, uh, big population of ibis. Uh, so there's various issues contributing to it. Uh, but through uh, the work of these experts, uh, we will kick off work um, after the summer period next year. Now, based on the management plan and the recommendations of that management plan, uh, this is not the type of work you would want to do during a summer period. They have recommended the appropriate time to kick off that work uh, is in April after the next summer when climatic conditions have cooled down a bit. Uh, and so I'm announcing today that from April we will get cracking and we will be investing more than a million dollars in cleaning up Forest Lake, improving that asset for the community out there. And I know that people from even further afield uh, and surrounding suburbs do enjoy Forest Lake uh, and, and benefit from it. To give you a bit of a background uh, of some of the experts that I mentioned, uh, Professor David Hamilton is the Deputy Director of the Australian Rivers Institute and is a professor at Griffith University. Uh, Prof professor Hamilton is a champion in his field with 30 years of experience in, in researching blue-green algae blooms. That's an interesting uh, area of expertise, but uh, he is a local expert on this particular issue, uh, and he's also an expert in water quality monitoring. He's uh, prepared more than 250 peer-reviewed publications. So this is definitely uh, a world-class expert that we have here locally when it comes to uh, water quality in, in water bodies such as this. Professor Hamilton recently published the Handbook on Lake Restoration. And so uh, he was also joined in that work by Tony Weber. Now, Tony Weber is also one of Australia's leading practitioners in the catchment modelling and water quality field and also has more than 30 years experience in the water industry. Tony was awarded the 2012 Fellowship from the Modelling and Simulation Society of Australia and New Zealand and has authored numerous policy, scientific and strategic research papers. He is a visiting scientist at CSIRO Land and Water Basin Management Outcomes Group in Canberra and was nominated as one of the top 10 water leaders in Australia in 2013. We have an extensive plan to combat the issues fa facing Forest Lake and to ensure that future generations enjoy this water body. Uh, Blue-green algae is one of the main factors affecting the lake and a major component of the recommendations outlined in the strategic man management plan involves desilting the lake uh, to remove the sediment which is built up over a period of many years. We also, once that is done, uh, have a program of replanting with certain species of plants, of water plants, that will help improve the quality of the water as well. Uh, there's ways that local residents can help too. Um, now, local residents haven't caused the problem, to be clear. Lord um, Mayor, your time has expired. Yeah, okay, thank you. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Chair. Chair, my question is the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, I refer to the list of cabs taken by Councillor Angela Owen in the 2018-19 financial year, detailed and answered to a question on notice from the opposition. On 28th of September 2018, Councillor Owen caught two cabs. The first trip was from a suburb on the south side of Brisbane to Boondall, where Cher was performing that night. That cost ratepayers $140.70. The second trip was back to the same suburb on the south side of Brisbane, which cost ratepayers $140.81. This means the total cost Excuse for me, that- hang on. Councillor Cumming, I made this point some time ago that there was to be no swearing in this chamber, and I'm very certain I just heard someone in this room swear. Um, that is an active disorder. If I hear it again, any individual will be removed, will be excluded from the meeting. Councillor Cumming. This means the total cost for that day was $281.51. Interestingly, Councillor Owen listed exclusive A reserve tickets to Sher on her disclosure of interests as a gift from Telstra. On 31st of January this year, Councillor Owen again caught two cabs. They were a return journey from a suburb on the south side of Brisbane to Boondall, where Keith Urban was performing that night. The return journey cost ratepayers $304.81. Again, Councillor Owen listed tickets to Keith Urban on her disclosure of interest as a gift. Lord Mayor, have you asked Councillor Owen why she makes ratepayers fund her expensive travel to and from concerts at Boondall and do you think this is a rort of ratepayers' money? Lord Mayor. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <sighs> the Labor Party is nothing but predictable. Um, and when it comes to slinging mud and personal attacks, uh, they are the absolute experts. What I will say is this. The number of times that I have seen state government ministers showing up to concerts and sporting events in their chauffeur-driven, taxpayer limos, while the limo driver waits outside for the entire time um, and then picks them up afterwards, I can't even count. So, point of order. Point of order to you, Councillor Cumming. Point of the, questions were, the question was clear. The Lord Mayor is not answering the question. Thank you, Councillor Cumming. I, 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 am, the, the I question, am about to answer the, the question. The answer has I been have going five for minutes. 30 seconds. So, Hang on. The, all answers will be heard in silence. There's quite a deal of time left. So I will simply point out, uh, Mr Mayor. Chair, that the chairs of council, so the equivalent of state government ministers, and in many cases much more effective than state government ministers, uh, do not get chauffeur drivers. And so, no, I, and, and, and I'm not suggesting that that should change, but they do not get chauffeur drivers, and, and they do not. The Lord Mayor's answer will be heard in silence, please. Lord Mayor. <laughs> uh, they do not have chauffeurs taking them to sporting events like they do up at George Street. But what they do have is the ability uh, to access a cab charge card. Now, this is not something I introduced. Uh, this is something that was introduced, as far as I can tell, uh, in the year 1983 uh, and has been um, the case ever since then. Now, I don't remember who was around in 1983 to introduce that because I was in year one at school in 1983. Um, but I'm pretty sure that it wasn't a Liberal administration or an LNP administration. I'm pretty sure it was a Labor administration. I can't change what has happened in the past, but I can make sure that going forward, the guidelines reflect appropriate use of cab charges for work purposes and make it crystal clear what you can and can't do. And so, I, as people would have seen in the Career Mail, uh, I have announced that a new set of guidelines, an updated set of guidelines to the 1983 version um, will be brought in as soon as possible. And that guideline will be modelled on taxi usage uh, that's appropriate at the state parliament level. And um, Councillor Johnston, your interjections have been particularly voluble. Please cease interjecting, Lord Mayor. And so I think it is important that uh, from time to time we update the policies to make sure there is very clear guidance on what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. Point of order, Mr Chair. Um, point of order to you, Councillor Cook. Uh, the question was very clear. Do you think this is a rort of ratepayers' money? It's not 1983, before I was born. Yeah, no, it's 2019. No, do not use point of orders to debate the subject matter, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, and so it is appropriate that uh, clear rules and guidelines exist, um, and I would assume that no one on the opposite side of the chamber would have any problems with the state government guidelines. Um, and so we will take them as the model going forward. Uh, so that is what we are going to do. Um, we will make it clear to everyone going forward uh, what is appropriate use. Um, and that is all I, all I will of, say on this matter. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Griffiths. Yes, the Lordman didn't actually say whether he thought it was a rort or not. That was the question. Well, that's, thank you. All right, uh, further questions? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Public and Active Transport and Economic and Tourism Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, state government projections forecast that Brisbane will have an additional 386,000 new residents by 2041. In light of this growth, how is this council planning for the future by investing in the public transport network, and what are the barriers towards making this investment a reality? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Davis, for the question. It is no secret that Brisbane has been growing at an immense rate over the past several years, whether this be economically or our people moving here or the development that we're seeing across the city. Brisbane is continually growing and maturing, and this has not happened by accident. It's been achieved by making sure we have proper planning and a city council that is focused on making sure that the Brisbane of tomorrow is even better than the Brisbane of today. 
Now, a major part of managing this growth is ensuring that we have the public and active transport infrastructure available to these thousands of people that live here and are moving here into the future. The state government has legislated that we need to plan for an extra 386,000 residents who are expected to move to Brisbane by 2041. That is 1,300 people a month. To make sure that these people can get around the city, we can't keep doing status quo. If we did that, it would mean we were reading straight out of the Labor Party handbook, which is a bright, shiny front cover with blank pages in the middle. The opposition are notorious for mismanaging everything. That's why Brisbane's transport system will never be fixed by them. They don't have the capacity to do so. The last time they were in charge, the new buses caught on fire. There was no great plan for where those buses were actually travelling. That is why Team Schrinner is 100 per cent focused on building the Brisbane Metro. We are 100 per cent committed and we will make sure that it gets done, regardless of how long it takes, regardless of the political interference that we continue to see from those at the other end of George Street, soundly and resoundingly supported by the blatant silence we hear on the opposite side of the administration who are not interested in fixing anything, who won't go and speak to their state government buddies and say, we need transport fixed in Brisbane. They sit in their hands and watch the merry-go-round that is the state government not give us approvals. Metro Works could start tomorrow. The cackling from the person in the corner would have more Bailey's mate we've seen in many photos on Instagram in the last couple of weeks, could have more buses to her precious suburbs that she whinges about every week in here when the metro was Councillor up Johnston, and running. Councillor Johnston, it's time to, to whatever you find so humorous, it's time to stop laughing, hey? Please? Please, can you uh, consider that a direction? Deputy Mayor. The biggest point to make is that works can begin tomorrow. Yeah. We just need approvals. There is no reason why we cannot turn the sod on the early works in South Brisbane. Regardless of where the new station is located, the politically manufactured new station by the state government, these works can happen right now. We can start the relocation of the sewer pumps. We can do the much needed intersection upgrade of Peel Street. We can start the investigations of exactly where the utilities are. This could all happen tomorrow if approvals were signed today. We have asked so many times now for these approvals, but every single response comes back from people within the cultural centre, even the South Bank corporations, deferring it to the political masters who say, no, we want to try something else at the absolute 11th and a half hour before midnight. It is time for the minister to show us that he actually supports Metro practically, not just in principle. It is absolutely amazing that a state government has a fully funded $1 billion project that will bring Brisbaneites faster and more reliable transport, which is usually their responsibility, mind you, Mr Chair, and it is being purposefully stalled at this point of time. And as a result, Brisbane commuters are held hostage. The Greens make them sit in traffic because of the weather. Labor make them sit in traffic because there's an election coming up. Shame. And it's clear from the data that we see here that our Brisbane buses are getting full. We've spoken in this place about Route 66, which had over 3,000 missed stops last financial year. Metro Line 2 will triple the amount of services that this line currently runs. We want to turn up and go service. We will make sure the Brisbane of tomorrow is even better than the Brisbane of today. We have a fully funded, game-changing infrastructure planned and ready to deliver. Let us get on and do it. Yeah. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Chair. Chair, my question is to Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, last week, in answer to a question on notice, it was revealed Councillor Angela Owen has spent as much as $300 return on ratepayer-funded cabs to Boondall. Coincidentally, these trips were on the same days as concert that she had disclosed as receiving tickets on her disclosure of interests. For six days, you took absolutely no steps to curb this outrageous rort until you were shamed into action by questions from a media organisation. 
So far in your short term as the unelected Lord Mayor, we've seen you backflip on the zip line, exorbitant grave fee increases for grieving parents, on the use of gender neutral language in the chamber, and on installing CCTV cameras to protect against dog baiting. Why does it take exposure by the opposition and the media for you to do the right thing? Lord Mayor. It doesn't. Further questions? Councillor Huang. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cooper, last week the Lord Mayor outlined details on Council's contribution to the Cooper's Plains Open Level Crossing. Has there been any further updates in the open, open level crossing debate? Are we any wiser on the state government's position on open level crossings? Councillor Cooper. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chair, and I thank Councillor Huang for the question. I think it's important to actually look at the history uh, of this particular issue and, and, of course, noting, and I think the comments made by the Deputy Mayor are absolutely accurate. Our city is growing, our region is growing, and growing significantly. So if you look by 2041, the region is expected to accommodate an additional 1.9 million residents, almost 800,000 new homes, and support 1 million additional jobs. So, of course, the majority of this growth is in the southeast corner. And it's very logical to assume that infrastructure investment should follow that growth. Invest where people are living, where people are working, and make sure that that infrastructure works well and accommodates that particular growth. This particularly, and of course we know Cross River Rail is now uh, underway, uh, this kind of infrastructure, the investment in public transport, will see an even bigger burden on open level crossings. Open level crossings will see the boom gates down longer than they are currently. And in some cases now, they are down one third of the hour every hour in the peak hour. And that is expected to significantly increase. So we saw in the lead up to the election in March 2016, the Australian Labor Party sought to fast track. So 2016, they were gonna fast track the elimination of the Coopers Plains open level crossing. And they estimated it would be a cost of $200 million. Disappointingly, the Deputy Premier went on the record in November of 2016 saying that open level crossings were not a priority for the state government. And she was on Steve Austin and she said, we have not earmarked level crossings as a huge priority at this stage. Seems bizarre when they were talking about delivering the Cross River Rail project. Nevertheless, uh, this Council, and we note that the Lord Mayor has now clearly put money on the table. He hasn't just talked about it, he hasn't pondered about it, he hasn't promised to fast track it and then done absolutely nothing. He has said we will be putting $40 million on the table for the Boundary Road rail crossing. It's money to get on with it. So that's pretty clear. We've got a commitment for Boundary Road. We've got $40 million commitment for the Lindham Road rail crossing. So that's two projects that Council has done, I think, uh, to show real leadership about tackling this particular issue. We've also been talking to the state government about developing a priority list of crossings. There's more than 40, say that again, more than four zero, 40 of these that impact on the road network of this fair city. 40. And what are we seeing from the state government? Absolutely nothing. We saw in August of last year, Minister Bailey admitted there'd been a 33% increase in near miss incidents reported at Queensland Rail level crossings in the 17-18 financial year. And I quote, an alarming 248 road users reported experiencing a near miss between their vehicle or themselves and a train at Queensland Rail level crossings. He admitted that, Mr Chair. His response to this very damning report was to run a media campaign. 
heavy metal stops for no one. He had heavy metal face painting, temporary tattoos, uh, and a rock star karaoke competition. That's the kind of thing that the Labor Party thinks is the way to tackle these sorts of issues. What a disgrace, Mr Chair. No commitment to actually doing any work on upgrading these sorts of facilities. No commitment to developing a priority list with this council. No plan to do anything at all. So we note that in Victoria, and that is uh, controlled by the Australian, um, down there in Victoria, it is the Australian Labor Party. They are removing 50 dangerous and congested crossings by 2022. 50, 50. They have set up a level crossing removal authority. They're dedicating billions of dollars towards sorting this issue out. We've got a commitment from the Lord Mayor. We've got federal government money on the table. Guess who hasn't come to the party, Mr Chair? Guess who hasn't put one dollar towards removing open Councillor level crossings? Cooper, we're going to have to wait because your time's expired. No doubt. Thank you, Mr further, Chair. Further questions? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, recently you told this chamber that you did not support policy changes which would significantly reduce existing property values and make housing cheaper for people on lower incomes. But your Liberal National Party is also strongly opposed to increase in New Start and the minimum wage, and your state colleagues are opposed to more spending on public housing. So if you don't want housing to get cheaper and you don't want incomes to rise, how do you think Brisbane should address its worsening homelessness and housing insecurity crisis? Lord Mayor. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the question, Councillor Shree, uh, through you, Mr Chair. Um, look, Councillor Shree uh, makes some claims about what the LNP at other levels of government thinks. I think he is mistaken and wrong about those claims. Um, I haven't heard uh, the LNP uh, at uh, the state level saying um, that there should, uh, there should be less spending on public housing. I haven't heard that being said. Um, but I am aware, though, for example, uh, that up at George Street, um, across the state of Queensland, there is a waiting list for public housing of 21,000 people. 21,000 people. And I am aware that the state government's big plan to deal with this is to build 4,000 houses across the whole state. 21,000 people on the waiting list and a plan to build 4,000 houses. But I'm also aware, and the state government um, won't tell you the figures on this because they're embarrassed, that in order to fund those 4,000, they are selling off existing public housing. They are flogging off every little piece of property and land that they can get. And you know what? Doesn't matter if it has bushland on it either. Doesn't matter if it's public housing. They are flogging it off. And then they want someone to pat them on the back for building 4,000 houses to house 21,000 people on the waiting list. So um, I reject the premise of your question, um, Councillor Shree. I think there is so much more that can be done to get people off the streets and to deal with housing affordability, but you've got to start right there. Because what I do know is that when our officers are out there talking uh, to the rough sleepers out in the CBD and inner city areas, we know that around 80% of those people are on the public housing waiting list. They're people that could get a house, 80% of them could get a house if the Labor Party or the state government provided those houses uh, to house people on that waiting list. So this is a serious problem, uh, but pointing the finger for party political reasons like uh, Councillor Shri is doing, uh, verbaling the LMP, um, is not going to help anything. What will help is if he directs his angst to where it will make the most difference, and that is up at George Street where they can deal with this public housing waiting list. Other countries other places have made significant inroads. There are answers out there. There are solutions. And while this will require extra investment, uh, it is something that can be achieved with a concerted policy uh, approach. And it's something that doesn't have to impact on the investment 
of people who have saved all their life to buy a house. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. Because in the end, uh, most people have the majority of their wealth in their home. Uh, and as I said, these mortgages, um, they've been paying them off for 25, 30, even longer years, saving for their family, saving for the future. Uh, and so to say that the only solution, or one of the only solutions for housing affordability is to punish those people that have been investing their own hard money, hard -earned money into their own house is, it's a binary option. It's saying you can either do one or the other. How about both? How about people can invest in their own homes and see the values go up over time? And how about the state government? Invest and in, in fact, with the help of the federal government, invests in building public housing to help deal with that 21,000 person waiting list across the state. I also understand that 5,000 of those people are here in Brisbane. That's right. So out of the 21,000 across the state, there are 5,000 on the waiting list here in Brisbane. 80% of the rough sleepers in our city are on that waiting list. So you know, this is a real issue, Councillor Shree, um, but I do not believe uh, that what you're saying is the appropriate way to go forward. I think that state government absolutely has to lead the charge here. The last time I checked, they were in charge of that public housing stock, public housing policy or social housing, as it is called. And uh, I also am aware that they are actively selling off public houses as well to help fund those 4,000 new ones. We've all seen it across different parts of the city where there have been um, housing commission or formerly housing commission owned houses that are being sold off into the private market and residents nearby are told, yeah, that'll allow us to have more money to build uh, new Mayor, public your time houses. Has so. Further questions? Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. I uh, move suspension of so much as standing orders to allow me to move the following urgency motion that Brisbane City Council immediately scraps cab charge vouchers for councillors. Seconded. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, um, you have three minutes to urgency. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the response we've just heard from the Lord Mayor uh, a few minutes ago, within the last half hour, is that he is okay with councillors rorting cab charge vouchers. That's what we've just heard. That's why this is urgent today, uh, because when it was put to him whether he thought this was a rort, uh, he dodged that question, Mr Chair. Uh, three times he dodged that question, Mr Chair. Uh, and the people of Brisbane deserve better than that. Uh, we know that councillors are given a $44,000 car, more expensive for those chairs over there, uh, Mr Chair, free fuel, free parking, free tolls. Uh, it is unreasonable uh, for the people of Brisbane to pick up the private travel to concerts uh, for LNP for, for LNP councillors, Mr Chair. So today, Council today... Sorry, Councillor, Councillor Johnston, I've asked you twice. You've been the sole interjector very loudly on, on numerous occasions. Once again, I'm asking you to cease interjecting or else I will begin the process around Section 21 of the local law. <laughs> Councillor Cass. Th thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. So this is this has now gone on for a week. The Lord Mayor has had the opportunity to show some leadership. Uh, it was put to him today uh, to show some leadership, <coughs> and he said we'll look at um, bringing in some guidelines, perhaps. Well, um, this really stinks, Mr. Chair. Uh, this does not meet any community expectations. Uh, Mr Chair, uh, this doesn't pass the what pub the test. pub test. That's the one, the pub test. I think if you walk down, uh, walk down the street, walk down the Queen Street Mall, whether it's in a pub or not, uh, and you say to someone, "There's a councillor, there's an LNP councillor up in that place, uh, and they're using your ratepayers' money to go to concerts out uh, of Boondle from Cassidy, their place," bring you back? is that okay? Bring you back? Can I bring you back to urgency, please? It's urgent. This is urgent because we have to deal with this now. The Lord Mayor won't, Mr Chair. He is weak. This is a weak Lord Mayor, Mr Chair, who will not act on this issue. He, he does not understand um, community expectations when it comes to the rorting of ratepayers' money. He has shown that time and time again. Uh, this has to stop, uh, Mr Chair. And as a, as a council, we have the opportunity to show some leadership where this Lord Mayor fails, Mr Chair. Uh, how can he be trusted? when it comes to ratepayers' money, when every time one of his team that stands there behind him rorts and rorts and rorts, and he says, it's okay. 
it's okay because some Labor mayor uh, introduced cab charges way back in 1983 when he was in grade one or something or other. Uh, but it's okay if my team rorts those. My LNP councillors can rort Point like of order. Point of order to you, Councillor Adams. I believe Councillor Cassidy is imputing motive. I agree. I agree. Please, Councillor, limit it, your it comments is, as to it is why, a fact. why it is, is, why a fact is urgent. Point of order. Uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, allow me to con conclude my statements. Councillor Cassidy, please limit your statements to the, to the purpose, which is why this matter is urgent, why it must be dealt with immediately. Point of order to you, Councillor Adams. People are sick of it. I am offended by the thing that he repeated after you directed him not to say it, that it was a fact. He is imputing motive and I ask him to withdraw it. Yeah, uh, Councillor Cassidy, would you please withdraw? No, it's a rort. Objectively, this is a rort and you people should be ashamed of yourselves. This is a rort. Okay. You can't again, be trusted. Again, and Councilor we need to Cassidy, deal with this today, Mr. I Chair. I appreciate yep. that, but why you've got 20 seconds. Well, thank you. Why must we do it now? Because people are sick and tired of the LNP rorting their rates. Yeah. That is why, Mr. Chair. It has to stop today. What is wrong with you people? All those in favour that this matter is urgent, say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The no is Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cumming and Councillor Cassidy. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Attendance, please close the bars. <coughs> Excuse me. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 20 against. The noes have it. Please return to your seats. Councillors will now recommence question time, the time remaining 15 minutes, 50 seconds. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Finance and Administration Committee, Councillor Allen. Councillor Allen, since the budget was released in June, the ALP has undertaken a scare campaign in Brisbane suburbs about rate rises. Can you remind the Chamber about past rates rises and how this administration continues to deliver the lowest minimum residential rates in South East Queensland? Councillor Allen. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Uh, Mr Chairman, I seek leave to suspend uh, so much as standing orders uh, as to standing uh, rules to uh, move an urgency motion calling on this council to undertake an immediate audit of the past three years of the chairman's uh, use of council cab charge vouchers to ensure that all uh, use of these vouchers was undertaken in line with appropriate rules. Seconded. Councillor Johnson, do you have, that's a bit more complicated than Councillor Cassidy's proposal. Do you have that in writing? I'm moving an urgency motion. Could you please repeat it word for word for everybody? And then, then you, and one, at your conclusion of that, you'll have three minutes to establish urgency. Yes. And not to debate the substance, but establish urgency. So you want please. me to repeat the urgency motion? Yes, please. Yes. Um, I seek leave to suspend standing orders to allow me to move an urgency motion that council conducts an immediate audit of all 
uh, Chairman's Council cab charge vouchers to ensure that they have been used uh, properly in line with all council procedures for the last three years. And second. You've got a second on Councillor Cook. So that urgency a motion has been moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Cook. Councillor Johnson, you have three minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, it, on the answers to the questions on notice today and last week, um, we've been given information about how some councillors have used um, cab charge vouchers. And honestly, I, I feel quite incredulous about um, the possible uses that have happened. Um, and I would think that uh, to ensure that things have done, been done properly, um, we should be ensuring uh, that the 2000, the last three years, uh, 16, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19, uh, are properly audited. Um, because I cannot imagine under any circumstances uh, that uh, the use of cab charge vouchers to attend concerts um, is an appropriate use of ratepayers' funds. Um, councillors have cars, ward budgets, chairmen have chairmen's budgets, they have gold passes, uh, those that have been here for you know, three plus terms. Um, they have car parks in King George Square, and it does not seem appropriate to me um, that they are using uh, cab charge vouchers when there are multiple other funding sources and also uh, um, modes Councillor Johnson, of I, I appreciate available. this is the substance of your concern. However, yep. the, the motion before us is yep. the urgency matter. Yep. So again, urgency, please. And, and to ensure, given that the Lord Mayor has just ruled out banning the use of these vouchers, yes. which in my view yes. is absolutely the right move um, because of all the reasons I just outlined, yes. um, they should be banned. That is my view. But as he will not ban them, we need to make sure that no one is rotting the system right. um, because it is outrageous, outrageous that some chair people are using them um, to attend uh, uh, events. I mean, Councillor Owen was in the paper saying that this was for her to go from uh, after council events home late at night, and now she's been at concerts. It, it does not stack up, and an immediate now, review Johnston, needs to be undertaken. You're, you're often a stickler for the rules, and yep. I must ask you to follow the rules. Um, please establish urgency. And, and an immediate the, the review purpose... needs to be undertaken because. Um, certainly, Councillor Owen's public statements have been at odds um, with what we have discovered uh, now. So, I, this is ratepayers' funding. I think it should be banned. If it's not being banned, um, there's a review going on up at George Street. We know the Lord Mayor loves to talk about what's happening at George Street. Um, he needs to do the same thing here to ensure um, that ratepayers publicly uh, funded cab charge vouchers aren't being abused for private purposes by any chairperson of council. And I would hope that he's going to ban them because of all the other funding sources that are out there and available to use. To the councillors <coughs> excuse me, who support urgency on this resolution, say aye. Aye. And to the contrary, no. No. The no's have Division. it. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Johnston. Eyes to, my uh, eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 20 against. The noes have it. Please return to your seats.
So, Councillor McLaughlin, um, I think it's probably for the best if you just repeat that question. Thank you, Mr Chair. Goes. I thought so too. Um, Mr Chair, my question is to the Chair of the Finance and Administration Committee, Councillor Allen. Councillor Allen, since the budget was released in June, the ALP has undertaken a scare campaign in Brisbane suburbs about rates rises. Can you remind the Chamber about the past history of rates rises and how this administration continues to deliver the lowest minimum residential rates in South East Queensland? Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank Councillor McLaughlin for the question. This administration has a strong track record of ensuring that ratepayers' money is managed responsibly. Only this administration, the Team Schrinner administration, continues to deliver a surplus budget year after year and ensures that Brisbane holds the title of having the lowest minimum residential rates in South East Queensland. All while ensuring basic services are maintained as well as continuing to invest in the projects that will ensure the Brisbane of tomorrow is even better than the Brisbane of today. The Schrinner budget delivered in June ensures that basic services continue to be provided as well as having a $900 million infrastructure spend and providing a range of new initiatives. The average rates for a Brisbane resident are just over $1,220 per annum, yet every single resident in Brisbane receives more than $2,300 worth of services. That's $2,300 worth of bin collections, public transport, library services, free events in parks, and the list goes on. There is no doubt that the ratepayers of Brisbane are seeing value for money in the service that Council provides. We are able to deliver our budget commitments while keeping rate increases to a modest 2.5 per cent. Yet that doesn't stop the Labor lies. With their latest leaflet hitting letterboxes across Brisbane suburbs, claiming rates under this administration are soaring. <laughs> what about you, Councillor Johnston? Yes, Mr. Chairman, you've ruled out um, of order calling something a lie. So I'm just wondering if you're going to apply the same standard uh, to an LMP chairperson about uh, the Labor Party. The same standard applies to all councillors. Uh, Councillor Allen, please continue. Mr. Chair. So out your microphone is not on. Uh, calling out the under this administration, rates are soaring, and then perversely calling for no more increases in council rates, a promise that demonstrably the Labor Party most definitely can't meet. It's just not in their DNA to manage money responsibly and to put a cap on rates is just absurd. Mr Chair, perhaps someone reminded them that their own track record is abysmal. And I said it in the budget speeches, there's an inconvenient truth that the opposition doesn't want the ratepayers to know. We won't, and the people of Brisbane won't forget that under the Labor Party, they increased rates by 6% on four different occasions when they were last in administration. Four times, Mr Chair, they're absolute hypocrites. The ratepayers got ripped off, their pockets were emptied by the Labor Party at that point in time, and you know what they got for it? One project delivered, the inner city bypass. And there's no doubt this is how Queensland Labor operates. Have a look at what's going on in George Street. State water charges up three and a half per cent, two years in a row. Car registration up three and a half per cent. Mr Chair, fear what Labor in City Hall would do. To say that they could run this administration without rate rises is an absolute nonsense. Yet we, the LNP administration, are delivering on projects such as the Kingsford Smith Drive upgrade, the Brisbane Metro, Wynnum Road upgrade, as well as more than 400 other congestion busting projects, all while ensuring we keep rates down at 2.5%. Mr Chair, the question that springs to mind for me when I hear Labor posturing on rates is what services and upgrades would Labor no longer provide to Brisbane residents if they were not going to increase rates? Now, but Councillor Griffiths, are, are you, you two are being very voluble. Please um, resist the urge to interject. Councillor. Mr Chairman, 
They could barely deliver council services to residents with 6% rate rises. How on earth are they going to do it with no rate increases? We know that if Labor were in charge of ratepayer money, it would be nothing but cuts and chaos. They are quick to cut fees and dish out money with no regard for prudent financial management and balancing the budget. It's the Labor way. Now, the truth behind the Labor Councillors, is that Councillor rate Allen. increases in suburbs Councillor are Allen. heavily affected. Councillors, all answers will be heard in silence, please. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr Chair. As we all know, rates are based on the valuation set by the state government, and a large element of rate increases is a function of rate rises. We seek to cap rate increases at 7.5 per cent and minimise the impact on ratepayers by smoothing the rates over three years. We'll take the Labor Party scare campaign and crit criticism on rate increases with a grain of salt. This administration continues to deliver a balanced budget with the QTC providing a strong with neutral outlook for Councillor the past Allen, seven years. Your time has expired. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Deputy Mayor, Councillor Adams. Last week, you were more than happy to accuse other councillors of telling, and I quote, a blatant lie in the chamber. During the same meeting, in response to a question about cameras being installed in the tea room at the Hawthorne Ferry Terminal, you said, and I quote, Ironically, it was the staff who asked for those CCTV cameras. Councillor Adams, members of our team have spoken to the impacted ferry workers and they deny ever requesting those cameras to be installed. Councillor Adams, why did you blatantly lie to the people of Brisbane and why did this council allow a multinational company that runs Brisbane ferries to import this disgraceful practice into Brisbane? Yeah. Councillor Adams? I did not lie. Transdev asked for the CCTV. Righto. Okay. Further questions? Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. My question is to the Chair of Field Councilor, Services. Sorry. Councillor Griffiths, once again, you were more loud than other individuals interjecting. Please cease interjecting or else I, I will move uh, to warn you. Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. My question is to the Chair of Field Services, Councillor Howard. Councillor Howard, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the opening of the Japanese gardens at Mount Kutha. Can you outline for the chamber how council celebrated and how this administration is giving residents more to see and do in our great city? Councillor Howard. Well, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the question, Councillor Mackay. Um, on Sunday, I did have the honour of representing the Lord Mayor at the Brisbane Botanic Gardens at Mount Kutha to celebrate the 30th anniversary of our beautiful Japanese garden as part of this year's Japanese Cultural Day. I was joined by Councillor Richards and we had an absolutely fabulous um, morning in amongst the Japanese garden. It, appear, it obviously has a special place in all of our hearts as it was a in fact gifted to the people by the chair of the Japan Association for Expo 88. It's a beautiful example of the friendship we have with Japan and our appreciation for Japanese culture and the contribution that Japan and our Japanese community has made to this city. And as the cha chamber may be aware, Brisbane shares a very special friendship with Japan and in particular with the beautiful city of Kobe. This special relationship was formalised in 1985 through the signing of the Brisbane Kobe Sister City Agreement. What some of you may not know is that this marked our city's first ever sister city relationship. And so we were very excited to come together on Sunday at the beautiful Japanese garden in Mount Kutha to celebrate Japanese culture at our 2019 Japanese Cultural Day. This year is a particularly special year. As you know, Councillor Mackay, as uh, we celebrated a very special milestone, as you mentioned, the 30th anniversary. One of Japan's leading landscape architects, the late Kenzo Ogata, designed the gardens. The theme of the gardens is mountain pond stream. It features the key elements of stone, water, ornaments, arbors, paths, and vegetation. Japanese gardens are usually evergreen gardens, and this garden contains a combination of native and exotic plants suitable for Brisbane's subtropical climate. Single trunk trees lean over waters or pathways. Our gardeners carefully prune shrubs to create a sense of open space and to frame the views. 
It is a beautiful garden and truly is a special place because it is a symbol of the special relationship that we have with Japan and the special place that Japan holds in our hearts. I would like to thank all the residents and Councillor Richards who joined us on Sunday for the Japanese Cultural Day to celebrate this special 30th anniversary of the Japanese garden being opened at the Brisbane Botanic Gardens at Mount Kutha. This event was a part of Brisbane's 2019 Japan Week festivities and provided a great opportunity for residents to enjoy the food and culture of Japan in a beautiful and serene garden setting, suitable for all ages, with something for everyone. The event was so much fun and it was great to see so many residents getting into the spirit of Japan Week by taking part in the traditional activities on offering. We had rice cake making, tea ceremonies, calligraphy workshops, ikebana flower arranging and woodblock printing. We also enjoyed live Japanese traditional music and taiko drum performances throughout the day. We had workshops including origami, storytelling and craft for kids, miso soup and sushi roll cooking classes. And it was great to see so many residents excited to have a go at making their own Kokodama plant ball. I hope I said that correctly. Residents brought their kimonos along to learn how to wear a kimono. There were so many fabulous demonstrations and martial arts displays to see while traversing the lovely gardens, and we had a range of, of treats on offer from our local food trucks. Thank you to everyone who came along to get involved in celebrating the 30th anniversary of Brisbane's treasured Japanese gardens. The Japanese Gardens is a special part of the Brisbane Botanic Gardens at Mount Kutha. Uh, it was founded in 1970 and officially opened in 1976. Uh, and Ross McLean McLennan tells the story of Sally Ann Atkinson asking uh, the, uh, the Consul for Japan to provide some of the funding, which apparently he did because nobody can actually say no to, to Sally Ann. Uh, the coll collections uh, located at Mount Kutha are recognised as part of Queensland's premier subtropical botanic gardens. The gardens provide an important space for conservation and appreciation of flora and nature. I really want to thank the, the officers, our dedicated officers and volunteers who look after our incredible botanic garden and for everyone who made the day such a fabulous day for us all to enjoy. It truly was a great success and I'd like to congratulate everyone involved for pulling it together. Such a fun-filled day for us all to enjoy. I'd also like to thank the Consulate General of Japan, Brisbane, for partnering with Council to deliver Howard, this your, event. Your time's expired thank you. and that concludes question time. Uh, councillors, I uh, draw your attention to the Establishment and Coordination Committee report. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 12th of August 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by <coughs> Excuse me. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, the 12th of August, 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Lord Mayor. Uh, yes. Um, Mr Chair, uh, the City of Brisbane and, in fact, the civic governance of the City of Brisbane is at a big turning point. It is a, at a turning point because never before, in the almost 14 years that I've been in this place, uh, or in the more than a decade that I've been a member of Civic Cabinet, have I seen an opposition without a single policy idea, a single plan for the future, and focused entirely on digging the dirt and slinging mud and personal attacks. I have never seen anything like it. And there's a saying, I think, um, Councillor Marks, you um, told me this one, the more dirt you dig, the more ground you lose. And Labor should learn from this, because it is a very wise saying. All they have got to offer is to sling the mud. Point they of do order. not have a single thing. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. I seek leave to move an urgency motion uh, and to suspend standing orders uh, to move a motion calling on Brisbane City Council to install a zebra crossing on a Pell Street outside Graceville Rail Station. And I need Seconded. Uh, there's, we've received an urgency motion from Councillor Johnston, seconded by Councillor Griffiths, about a pedestrian crossing in Graceville. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Councillor Johnston, you've got three minutes. 
Thank you. Um, this issue is urgent because the Lord Mayor has just stood up here for the last five minutes and claimed that uh, I and others don't have any policy issues or agenda issues that they want to run in this city. Now, I wouldn't want to stand Council up and say Council he's Johnston, lying because- I've got to stop you there. Yep. Um, yeah. You know, uh, urgency motions are a way yeah. to, um, to bring forward items yes. that are of, a, of an urgent yes. matter. However, I take a dim view of them being used as an in-speech rebuttal tool, which is what I think you're doing at the moment. So please stick to the, please stick to the urgency and do not use this point of order, uh, do not misuse this point of order uh, uh, so that you may criticise the Lord Mayor in the middle of his presentation. It's a cynical ploy. Councillor Johnston. Let me be clear. The people of Graceville don't think waiting for years and years and years and being ignored by this LNP administration for simple things like refuges and zebra crossings um, is frivolous or a waste of time. And I think it is appalling, appalling um, that this administration will not act when ideas are brought to them uh, to ensure that our city uh, has the initiatives that it needs uh, to deliver for our residents. Now, this matter is extremely urgent because I've been asking for years. I reckon six or seven years it's been on my budget uh, request list. We campaigned as part of Move Safe. It is strongly desired by our community. It fits with Council's agenda to improve safety around and access to public transport. And yet this Lord Mayor, all he wants to do is stand up in this place and use his Councillor time as Johnston, the leader of no, this no, city no. to as claim I, no, others Johnston, have no idea. Councillor Johnston, you do not no speak idea. while I speak. As I said, there is an opinion that you have used this point of order as a cynical opportunity to criticise the Lord Mayor, and I think that's what you're doing. So please stick to the matter at hand, the subject matter, and why, is it, why it is urgent. I think I'm Councillor being extremely Johnston. clear. The Lord Mayor has said that there are no ideas in this place. I'm telling you that we want a crossing outside Graceville Rail Station. We believe it is urgent. The, what the Lord Mayor is saying to this place is fundamentally wrong, and it is urgent that residents in Graceville have safer access to public and active transport. Me and every other opposition councillor in this place um, put in submissions, do petitions, and the LNP administration votes them down week after week. So it is urgent because the Lord Mayor is misleading the people of Brisbane by saying there are no other ideas out there. We put these ideas up and I've put them up and I want to see the Lord Mayor support the zebra crossing outside Graceville Rail Station on Appel Street to provide safer access for our school children, for commuters and for local residents to access public transport in Tennyson Ward. The urgency motion has been proposed by Councillor Johnston. All those in favour of urgency on this matter say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division called Seconded. by Councillor Johnston. Seconded. And Councillor Griffiths. Eyes to my right, noes to my left. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 20 against. The noes have it. Please return to your seats.
Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. I think there's interesting psychology at play here. Uh, when I was referring to the Labor opposition and their grubby tactics, the one person to get up and defend them, the great defender of the Labor Party, the person who goes out to our community Point of and order, Mr. really Chairman. a Liberal but is in bed with the Labor Point Party 100%. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point, Mark Point, Point, of, order, uh, point of order, Councillor Johnston. Point uh, Councillor Johnson, you've got a point of order? Well, Councillor Maddox, uh, extremely voluble interjections might be one of them, but secondly, claim to be misrepresented. I guess it's the acoustics still on that side. Um, your uh, claim to be misrepresented has been noted. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you. Um, look, pedestrian crossings are always uh, good local projects, and I understand this one is currently under consideration by Council. And so, uh, look, if that's, if that's your idea for the vision of the future of the city, fair enough, we'll, we'll take that on notice. Uh, but I was talking about a real plan for the whole of Brisbane, an approach for the whole of Brisbane Point of order. vision for the whole Point of, of order, Brisbane. Councillor Griffith. Mr. Actually, Chair. I'm going to stop you there. Councillor Murphy, you've been very voluble this meeting, and I ask you to please um, resist the urge to interject. Councillor Griffiths, you're, you're That was actually order. my point, that there's a lot of noise coming from over there and they're not being pulled there's, up on it. Councillor Griffiths, there's a lot of noise coming from everywhere. And I, um, you went here last week. Point of order. No, no, I'm addressing- Then you should be point. consistent I'm, with I'm, your ruling. No, Councillor Griffiths, sit down. Um, as you weren't here last week, where we had an extensive uh, discussion about this, um, I do tolerate a great deal of interjections from you and others. Um, however, there's a line um, the councillors have crossed from time to time, um, and uh, as I said, I tolerate a great deal from a great many councillors. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. And so Labor can laugh, Labor can interject. Labor can make nasty personal comments, uh, can make all kinds of accusations, but they have nothing else to offer. Now, people across the city know what this administration stands for. They know what our vision is. They know that it's about better public transport. It's about upgrading and building new infrastructure. It's about creating the biggest new park in 50 years, creating a green future fund that delivers real outcomes for the people of Brisbane. It is about investing right across the suburbs in the things that matter to people. They know that's what we stand for, and they will continue to make sure that they support that kind of agenda, I believe, because it, was, it is what they are calling from, for. But, Mr Chair, uh, it was interesting to hear Councillor Cummings' question before, and um, look, it was you know, it was quite amusing, Councillor Cumming, uh, that you would try to claim that anything that you uh, assume to be positive from this uh, side of the chamber was initiated somehow by the Labor Party. That was essentially the premise of your question. Um, but le let me call you up on that one. Apparently I'm a copycat, according to Councillor Cumming. Um, I think he referred to a few things. He referred to things like the zip line, uh, cemetery fees, cameras in dog off leash areas and cab charges. Now, um, apparently it was the Labor Party that was somehow calling for these things to change. Well, let's put that to the test. Uh, personally, I've never, not once, received a single representation from anyone in the Labor Party about any of those things. Not the zip line. The Labor Party didn't contact me to, to say, cancel the zip line. They didn't say that. They made no contact with me about that. Uh, they didn't do so on the other issues that were mentioned on that list as well. They made no contact whatsoever. And they've been caught out on this approach before because when an issue comes up, their first reaction is, politics above people. Their first uh, priority is party politics above people. And so they will go, instead of raising an issue with the Lord Mayor or an appropriate chair, they will go to the media and raise that issue. And so 
In, on all of those issues, right I don't believe I've received a single representation from Labor on any of them. Not a single one. But you know, Councillor Johnston, no, hang on, Councillor Johnston, stop there, please, uh, Lord Mayor. Councillor Johnston, I direct you to cease interjecting uh, from this meeting, uh, in, interjecting in this meeting, and if you do not comply with my direction, you will be warned, Lord Mayor. Mr. Chair, and so they're quick to score a political point because they're all about the politics. But you know what? There are opportunities to achieve things together in this place constructively. And I'm sure that people can see that when a reasonable issue comes up and there's a need to reconsider, we do that. We listen to people. But on those issues, who did we listen to? We didn't listen to the Labor Party. We listened to the community. And that is a big part of our job. We are here to make decisions on behalf of the community. We are here to get things done. But I can tell you right now, we are not too, we are not too fixed in our ways to understand that it is important to listen to the community on these issues and it's important to review decisions from time to time. And that is something which I think when you talk to people out in the streets, they would say that is a reasonable approach. We're glad that we have a council administration that actually takes the time to listen to people and reassesses and not digs its heels in and, and is stubborn, but to listen to people. Yet you have a small minded opposition who's only interested in playing politics. It will go straight to the media before raising a legitimate issue with the Lord Mayor or a committee chair. Uh, they are just interested in the mudslinging, in the political point scoring, and have zero vision for the future. And they're quite liberal in uh, slinging insults around. And we've heard them making all claims about rorting uh, today. I can tell you the biggest rort that's happening in this place is the fact that there's a councillor in this place who takes home extra salary each year, year after year, to be the leader of the opposition and only does a part-time job at that role. That is the biggest rort. Every week, ratepayers' money is being burnt up, paying the leader of the opposition when he outsources his job to everyone else. How many times have we seen Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook stand up and do the leader of the opposition's Point job order, for Mr. them? Chair. How many times have we seen them do Point the radio? Cook. How many Lord times Lord have we seen? Councillor John okay, Councillor Johnston. Councillor Johnston, I hereby warn you that unless uh, you, you cease interjecting, you will be suspended for a period of eight days. Furthermore, Councillor Johnston, if you are suspended, uh, you must immediately leave the meeting place and must remain away from all meeting places for the period of the suspension. Councillor Cook, your point of order. Uh, Mr Chair, those comments by the Lord Mayor are clearly defamatory and should be withdrawn. Um, Lord Mayor, there's been a request that you withdraw those comments. I, I'm not sure how they're defamatory. I, I do not agree with that assessment. Um, I was simply pointing out that the Leader of the Opposition is a part-time Leader of the Opposition. And, people, and you, you should be angry about this, Councillor Cook, order, because Mr. you're Chair. doing his job for him. Point of order to you, Councillor Cook. Again, claiming someone he knows is in a full-time position, no, no, hang on. No, no, is doing a part-time do, job, is defamatory. It's a you lie. Don't, you don't use a point of order to debate me. Lord Mayor, please continue. I'm sure Councillor Cumming uh, does a good job in his ward, um, or, or a reasonable job, maybe. A reasonable job. Let me correct the record, a reasonable job. Um, but as the Leader of the Opposition, uh, we've seen a lot of leaders of the opposition come and go, and I must admit, I must admit, I had assumed that Councillor Cumming was on his retirement leg, on his way out, but he's confirmed that he's not. So what is going on? Every opportunity to stand up on behalf of his team, to front the media, to deal with issues, um, he squibs them. And he was finally uh, motivated into action yesterday to defend his Lord Mayoral candidate. And with friends like that, wow. who needs enemies? Who needs enemies? But the reality is this. This is a team that is in disarray, disunited. I don't know who is in charge over there. We know their candidate is not in charge. 
We know that Councillor Cumming is not Councilors, in charge. The answer we heard in silence, but I think Lord Mayor's presentation we heard in silence. And we know they have nothing positive to offer the city of Brisbane. Uh, they, their policy is there is one policy, and that is to throw the dirt, to dig the dirt, to throw as much mud as possible, and hope that something sticks. That is it. That is simple. I've been saying this for weeks, and every week, week after week, they prove this to be the case. They prove it to be the case. Now we will, we will continue to call Labor out. Councillor Cook, Councillor Cook, Councillor Cook, please cease interjecting. Councillor Cook, please do not ignore my direction. Lord Mayor. I oh, thank you. We will continue to call Labor out on their grubby approach, uh, because, as I said, uh, the community, the community deserves better. And the more dirt they dig, the more ground they will lose. Now, turning to something constructive, turning to something positive, turning back to our agenda, which is about building the infrastructure our city needs and protecting our great lifestyle right across the suburbs. That's right, Councillor Cook. Yeah, That's Councillor correct, Cook, Councillor Cook. I have asked you. I have actually. I've directed you to cease interjecting, and you have and you have continued to do so, Councillor Cook. I direct you to cease interjecting, and uh, if you do not comply with my direction, you will be warned, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, this week uh, is Seniors Week, and uh, in line with our commitment to deliver on our vision to make Brisbane easier to get around, uh, I can flag to people that there are only seven weeks to go until the 1st of October when free seniors off-peak travel comes into effect on council buses, uh, ferries and Lord city Mayor, your time has expired. Move for an extension. Seconded. An extension of time has been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Richards. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you. And look, while well, the state government may try to prop up their black hole budget uh, by um, getting more revenue from council. Uh, we are committed to this initiative and making it happen because we are committed to our seniors. Many people aren't aware that the way this thing will happen is that council will pay the state government for these subsidised fares, for these free fares. Many people still believe that it is the Brisbane City Council that, fets, uh, that sets fares and collects fair revenue, uh, when we all know very well uh, that it is the state government who does that. Uh, and while this is something, this is an initiative that should be uh, rightly introduced by the state government, uh, they have declined the opportunity to do that. We even gave them the opportunity to introduce uh, a similar package on their Queensland Rail Network which they are wholly responsible for. Uh, and all they could do is uh, make a, a cheap political response in return to that. So we're getting on with it. Seven weeks to go. I'm looking forward to the seniors of Brisbane getting out and about, taking advantage of that free off-peak travel. And as I said, it will be on uh, buses. Point of order, Mr Chair. Cats. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Will the Lord Mayor take a question? Lord Mayor, will you take a question? No, he won't. Lord Mayor, please continue. But in uh, honour of uh, the Seniors Week this, this week, uh, I can say that uh, we're having King George Square, Victoria Bridge, Redcliffe Place and the Story Bridge lit up in pink, purple and gold today and tomorrow night um, to acknowledge that Seniors Week and the contribution that seniors make to our great city. On Thursday, Victoria Bridge, Redcliffe Place, the Tropical Dome at Mount Coother, the Story Bridge and King George Square will be lit up yellow for Daffodil Day. Uh, as we know, uh, Daffodil Day is a major awareness day for cancer, uh, run by the Cancer Council in each state and territory. And on Sunday, the Story Bridge and Victoria Bridge will be lit blue, green, white and yellow in recognition of Australian South Sea Islander Day of Recognition. This is the day the federal, federal government officially recognised Australian South Sea Islanders as a distinct cultural group. And we have so many great um, and diverse cultural groups in our city, uh, and it was an absolute delight uh, to join a couple of them on the weekend um, with the India Day Fair being held uh, in the Roma Street Parklands um, and thousands of people turning out to that event. And also that morning, the Korea 
uh, the Korean Society uh, Festival um, here in King George Square as well. And um, I want to thank all the different councillors that um, attended those events. Uh, we had great representation. Uh, it was great to be joined by Councillor Marx for the Korean Festival, uh, and also to be joined by many councillors for uh, the India Day Fair, uh, including uh, Charles Strunk on um, the other side of the chamber, but many from our side as well, including Vicky Howard, uh, Councillor Amanda Cooper, Councillor Tracy Davis, uh, Councillor Angela Owen, Councillor Kim Marks, and have I missed anyone? Oh, yourself. That's right. <laughs> I did. And Mr. Councillor Chair. Allen. Councillor Allen was also there. Uh, and Councillor Allen. So uh, we, had, we had a great contingent at the India Day Fair. So many people, I forgot a couple. Apologies. But um, uh, our Indian community makes such a great contribution, and, and it was great to have that event um, in Roma Street. Going forward to the formal items on the agenda today. Uh, item A is the resumption of land for park purposes at 97 Chalk Street, Lutwich. The council is planning yet another new suburban park, uh, this one located in Chalk Street, Lutwich, as part of our $16.7 million commitment to delivery of parks across the city. Uh, 97 Chalk Street, Lutwich is a 617 square metre parcel, which has been identified in the local government infrastructure plan and Lutwich Road Corridor Neighbourhood Plan as a proposed park. Council has already acquired nine of the surrounding properties for the creation of this parkland. 97 Chalk Street is the tenth and final parcel of the land required for this proposed park. The total size will be 6,980 square metres in size. So this is you know, yet another park, and, and it's almost on a weekly basis we are seeing acquisitions coming through to the chamber where we're buying up land to build new parkland, buying up land for community purposes. And it is in stark contrast to the state government that week after week wants to sell off property, whether it's bushland or public housing. Uh, we have a distinctly different approach, which is to expand community facilities, not to flog them off. Item B is the QU strategic intent document. Uh, previously, this chamber has um, seeing the QEU corporate plan, and that comes to the Chamber for approval each year. Now, however, because of the changes to the participation agreement, QEU will present a statement of strategic intent rather than a corporate plan. So this is a replacement of that corporate plan. Strig uh, the statement of strategic intent will require approval from Council every five years. The strategic plan outlines, just like the corporate plan did, the corporate and operational objectives, strategies and performance outcomes, financial plans and targets, participation return and estimated returns. The corporate objectives of QEU are to ensure that they are customer focused while providing social and economic value, environmental leadership, foundational success and to provide a constructive corporate culture. While the financial plan anticipates that demand per person uh, across South East Queensland will remain stable. Um, and it's been interesting to see, and, and this is one of the genuine uh, success stories um, of, I guess, water use management, on a, well, not only on a national scale, scale but a, a global scale. Uh, before um, the drought struck back in uh, the mid-2000s, Household water use in Brisbane uh, was up in the 200 litres per day, um, per person. And um, we saw, so we saw this massive use of water per, uh, per household, sorry, um, across the city. And we all remember the days when people used to hose down their driveways. Um, and, you know, it was part of, I guess it was part of a culture until then. Then we had the drought and everything changed. And I have to say, our water use has been consistently low, below that uh, 200 uh, litres ever since then. Um, there have only been you know, really few minor occasions where it has exceeded that. And so even more than a decade on from that drought, people's water use continues to be at more sustainable levels and the community deserves absolute credit for that. Um, and that is obviously something that QUU is very aware of and very supportive of. QU have proposed uh, $1.8 billion in infrastructure spend over the next five years. 
and this is to ensure that uh, the supply meets the demand with more than 670,000 dwellings predicted to be serviced by QUU by 2024. Item C is uh, the end of the road cafe lease at Brunswick Street New Farm, uh, and that is um, a, an existing uh, cafe in place in an old ferry terminal. Uh, together with Councillor Howard, I was very um, fortunate to be part of the official opening of that cafe many years ago, um, taking what was a disused council asset, creating an opportunity for a cafe and public toilets at that location. Uh, and um, the, uh, the lease that's coming through today uh, represents the continuation of the existing arrangement in place. Um, and so that that business, that local small business can continue to operate as they have successfully done. Uh, in April this year, uh, council went out to tender, offering a lease for up to eight years. We received one uh, tender response in, uh, in response to our opening up of that process. The offer of a lease of six years was part of that, and it was from the current operator. And after an assessment by council officers, this submission was accepted. The lease is proposed to start on the 1st of October, the same day that the new seniors travel comes into play and run for the six years from that point onwards. And so I wish the operators continued success and all the best for the future. I know that they are a small but much loved cafe in that part of Brisbane, uh, which Councillor Howard also knows very well. I think that's it for the formal agenda items, Mr. Chair. Further speakers, Councillor Cumming. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair, in relation to uh, item A, uh, we're supportive. Uh, uh, city needs uh, parks in areas where there's uh, uh, multi-storey development occurring, and uh, this uh, resumption is necessary to complete the uh, resumption of properties for the establishment of the new park. So we're supportive of that. Relation to item B. Uh, I, uh, we do have some concerns about this uh, item. The, uh, just, I think, a lack of information would be the, the criticism I have of it, uh, and the, so that some of the uh, figures quoted, uh, really, you can't understand what they mean, I guess. Uh, and uh, I refer to uh, page four of the document, uh, under the heading Constructive Culture. There's reference to embrace our leadership philosophy and create a work environment that delivers high performance. And the measure is growth in constructive leadership behaviour. And the target leader, leader effectiveness 4.5 slash 5. Underneath it's got trust index 69%. Well, with respect, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, and uh, Below again is positive comments, 75%. Employee experience ind index, 68%. Well, yeah, could mean anything. Uh, and uh, in relation to on the uh, next part of that page, under foundational success, uh, the reference to the uh, objective of becoming a truly customer-centric business that delivers an effortless CX. CX. Um, and it's got effortless customer experience. And, and the target is uplift in brand tracks, and I quote, perception of customer service score to 7.4 per cent. Yeah, not 7.3, not 7.5, not, not 8, 7.4. What's the highest and what's the lowest, as Councillor Strunk said? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so generally, uh, generally the... Uh, as I said, very, very vague. One, one thing about it is, as uh, we all know, this uh, organisation means council gets a very uh, large chunk of dividends uh, every year and continues to do so in the, into the future uh, with over uh, nearly $159 million uh, being promised into the long term. And of course, this is uh, the council, this, despite this massive uh, chunk of revenue every year. This is the council that cut pensioner discounts for water just a few years ago and uh, so uh, when they could have easily afforded to keep them going. In relation to item uh, C, the stores board submission, uh, look I, I think the, uh, 
quite surprised by this that, that there'd be only one tenderer uh, interested in this. It seems a, a very good location for, uh, for to run a coffee shop, and given the uh, given that's a sort of pretty active market in around Brisbane, the uh, coffee shops. Uh, it's uh, I think the uh, council's failed to uh, I suppose failed to interest the market in the in the. Uh, proposed lease and it's quite surprising and quite disappointing that there's only one uh, less one applicant to the uh, to apply to lease to the, pr the property that can the existing tenderer I uh, for that reason we don't know whether it's this is a good deal or not for the ratepayers and uh, we won't be uh, supporting the item I would ask uh, that items B and C be dealt with uh, separately for voting purposes from item a. Mr. Chair, item A and item A to be taken separately from items B and C. For B and voting. C. Yeah. Thank you. Noted. Further speakers, Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to uh, speak on item B, the Queensland Urban Utilities Draft 2024 Statement of Strategic Intent. And, uh, Mr. Chair, I would uh, note that Council continues to have a, a very strong collaborative uh, working relationship with QUU. Um, and at the risk of potentially touching on some of the points the Lord Mayor raised earlier. Um, QUU provide water and sewerage services to more than 600,000 dwellings, covering over 14,000 square kilometres of area from Toowoomba to Moreton Island and from the New South Wales border to Yabba State Forest. So a, uh, a big operation, big footprint. And throughout these communities, QUU infrastructure network consists of 9,391 kilometres of water mains and 9,594 kilometres of sewerage mains, 109 water reservoirs, 61 water pump stations, 85 water boosters and 333 sewerage pump stations. So a, a very large operation, uh, very capital intensive. Um, as part of the participation agreement that went through this chamber in May, um, QUU no longer will prepare a five-year corporate plan to be approved annually. Rather, QUU will prepare a strategic intent document, which we have before us today, and this will be reviewed every five years and approved by participating councils. The requirement is that the majority of participating councils are required to approve the strategic intent. While dividend predictions have decreased since the previous corporate plan, overall dividends have increased since the change of methodology in the participation agreement. And the change in methodology has meant that participating councils will receive a minimum dividend with the opportunity for up to 25% more if performance is good. And so this is a, a positive change for councils in that they have stability in um, actually preparing budgets and the like, and also ensures that QUU can uh, properly budget for what, as you could appreciate, is a very, very extensive capital program. They need to continue to invest in upgrading and, uh, and replacing their existing network. So uh, that's a critical requirement. And uh, having flicked through the, um, the strategic intent document, uh, I can attest to the fact that a lot of the values that are espoused in that document I've seen uh, at first hand recently. Um, QUU are undertaking a, uh, a really innovative uh, water treatment solution in the Northgate Ward. They've um, engaged extensively with my office. Um, it's quite evident from that engagement that the, uh, the uh, values that are uh, outlined here are being lived every day through that particular process. And I'd also point out to the point that Councillor Cumming made. You know, this is a, a high-level corporate document. It's meant to have a, a life of five years. Um, it's not the detailed annual operating plan that an organisation such as QUU would, uh, would undertake uh, on an, an annual basis, but certainly it gives an excellent snapshot of the uh, relationship and how they're going to operate with uh, their stakeholders, which include not only the community, but also their council shareholders. And thank you. Further speakers? All right. The, uh, Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. <clears throat> I rise today to speak on item A, um, 97 Chalk Street, Lutwich. As the Lord Mayor rightfully said, 97 um, Chalk Street, Lutwich was identified in the Lutwich Neighbourhood Plan um, as a proposed park. This is the last purchase of land in this particular section. Nine properties have already been purchased. So this will allow Council to proceed 
in um, developing a new park for the Lutwich area. Um, Mr Chair, I'd also um, like to put on the record that this council on this side of the chamber are determined to deliver more green spaces and more things for people to do in open space across this city. And I look forward to working with Councillor McLaughlin um, to develop this park in the future. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I just rise to speak on item uh, B and C very briefly. Uh, just respect, with respect to item B, the QUU strategic statement of strategic intent, I just want to place on the record my concern about uh, a number of things that I read in this report. Um, firstly, um, with respect to foundational success, um, we're saying, it's saying in this document that there will be a 10 per cent increase in capacity utilisation. I'm really hoping that does not mean um, that we are going to uh, just allow more and more development to be built, more and more usage of the existing inadequate sewer system uh, in our uh, city. Um, before uh, upgrades will be undertaken, because in older suburbs like uh, the ones I represent, there is a significant problem with cracks, breakage, leaking, both with sewers and uh, with the water supply, and that is really problematic. So I'm a little bit concerned that there appears to be a target uh, talking about um, increasing capacity utilisation of existing assets. Uh, because that just will put more pressure back on a system now that is old and inadequate. So I, I don't support that. Um, I also was concerned about the operational objectives. Um, there's response to unplanned water and sewage interruptions. Um, it seems to me that setting uh, a benchmark of responding to urgent incidents 80 per cent within one hour is not, uh, is not acceptable. Um, OK, 80 per cent within one hour, but the other 20 per cent, that's not OK. We can wait up to a day in my area when we have water bubbling out of Ashby Street and Fairfield Road, um, and in one case, uh, almost uh, a week to get it fixed. Now, that is water leaking out of the water mains. So there is a problem, I think, with how QU are prioritising uh, priority incidents and the timeframes in which they are addressing those incidents. Um, Non-urgent incidents are 24 hours. That they honestly can be well up to a week. But the biggest surprise in here, which is not really a surprise, um, is with respect to the financial targets. Now, uh, the financial targets indicate that uh, the dividend payments are going to uh, rise this year, $177.5 million. Uh, back to the stakeholders, of which Brisbane City Council owns 85 per cent. Then they're forecast to be 156 million, 159 million, one, and 159 million going forward. Now, um, there is a little dip. So you'd be thinking, well, OK, QU are forecasting that they're going to have uh, less revenue or less income. They're going to make capital investment that's going to decrease the return to, uh, to the shareholders or they're going to increase their infrastructure, or they're going to offer rebates, uh, possibly to Brisbane residents. But no, none of that is happening. When you look at the uh, forecast uh, financial statements, there are some very disturbing trends that are happening. Uh, in, from 19 to 20, um, revenue will increase by 6% from $902 million to $957.5 million. Uh, the equivalent in expenses is increasing from 317.2 to 323.6. That's a 3 per cent increase. So revenue is rising by 6 per cent. Expenses are only rising by 3 per cent, and that's over the next year. Um, that's not acceptable. Um, in my view, as a, a, a member of this council and as a shareholder in QUU, QU New should not be profiting uh, from uh, the water and sewage charges that it draws from the residents of Brisbane. I believe this is wrong, and I believe that we should be saying to QUU as a council that we do not agree uh, with this approach. But it gets worse. From then 19 to 20, oh sorry, 20 to 21, my apologies, 20 to 21, 
and I'm on page seven of the document if anybody wants to follow along. Uh, net revenue is a forecast to increase from 957.5 to 986.6, and that's up from this year, 902. So over the two years, that is a 9.3% increase in revenue. 9.3% increase over two years. Expenses, however, are actually going to decrease from 20 to 21. They're going, um, they're going to uh, only increase uh, by 1.3%. So the profit take from QUU in 2021 is 8% up. So it's up 3% over the next year and then up 8% over the two years. Now that's just not acceptable. Um, meanwhile, as a shareholder, I would have thought um, Councillor Allen would stand up and say, well, that doesn't make sense because, as he heard me say, um, the amount of distribution back to the shareholders in 2021 is 159 million, less than the 177 million this year. So why is it QUU is taking uh, more revenue out of the people who pay uh, for their services, for water and sewerage? Why is it that they are going to optimise asset utilisation by 10 per cent, which means basically try and get more out of degraded infrastructure and hold on to it for longer? And why is it that uh, revenue is increasing um, out of kilter uh, to expenses, uh, which means QU is pocketing increased profits? And we can see that, uh, massively pocket pocketing increased profits. So I do not agree uh, with uh, what is proposed here. Um, I think QUU is heading in the wrong direction. Um, it should not be run as a big commercial company. It should be run, I believe, in, in the way of a not-for-profit company for the benefit of the shareholders. Um, and that does not mean ripping money out of it um, to plug back into the budget. Um, to pork barrel in LNP wards, yeah. which is what's been happening for the past 10 years. So to me, we should be running it in a financially sustainable way that sees the customers of QUU getting value for money, um, that sees uh, investment into the necessary infrastructure. And I don't know why we have to take profits back out of this company at all. Why don't we just run it uh, in a way uh, that means that customers are not being charged um, huge amounts of money so councils can profit. Now, here's an idea for you, Lord Mayor. We're an 85 per cent shareholder in QUU. Um, he's not here, by the way, and this is why perhaps he, he doesn't realise that I have ideas and others have ideas. Yes. The, commercial, the commercial profit motive of QUU is wrong. We, as the 85 per cent shareholder, should be reassessing um, how the financial model of this organisation is run. Um, in my view, we should be making it uh, more equitable for customers by reducing the cost um, and making sure we invest appropriately in the necessary infrastructure. Simply ripping 177 million or 160 million out for our council um, to profit from and then not put back into drainage, like that money is not going into council drainage, um, it's going into LNP wards for uh, a good pork barrel. So here's an idea. QUU operating model needs to change. Uh, we need to make it financially uh, responsible and sustainable. Oh, he's back. Excellent. Um, he needs to read it. But this QUU financial model that's all about profits and not about the proper investment that we need uh, and the proper services for, uh, for people who are paying huge amounts of money for water and sewerage um, simply uh, so Brisbane City Council can rake in $177 million along with the other shareholding councils. Uh, that is wrong and I believe um, that we need to change the financial model of how QUU works. Um, because clearly, as this strategic document uh, shows, um, if it's decided on here today, this council is endorsing 8% increases to revenue at QUU. Now, that means simply that the cost to um, Brisbane residents for water and sewerage is going to increase. 
Now we know how much the Lord Mayor hates rates going up, so I'm sure he's going to stand up and be outraged about how uh, water and sewerage is going through the roof under his watch at Brisbane City Council. Now I've put an idea on the table about how we can change the way uh, this financial model works. Um, I don't expect the Lord Mayor will pay any attention. He'll just stand up again next week and say no one's got any ideas on this side of the chamber. Um, but for too long, um, uh, for too long now, QUU um, has taken money out of the hands of Brisbane residents unnecessarily. These are essential services um, that we should be supplying at an at cost <coughs> basis. Councillor Johnston, your time has expired. Are there further speakers? Councillor Richards. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Marks, that this council now adjourn for the purpose of afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the, door and the doors have been locked. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.
All right, welcome back. Uh, are, there, are there any further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak um, on item A. Obviously, I'm supportive of this motion, but I, it's struck me as a good example of the, one of the tensions or inconsistencies in the administration's current strategy around the provision of green space, which is simply that this land is really expensive. These sites cost a lot of money, and it's, it's good that we're buying this site, and it's good that we're completing this public park. But it, it makes visible how the administration has kind of backed itself into a corner where it can no longer afford to provide enough public green space in rapidly growing parts of the city. Um, with this neighbourhood plan, the administration correctly included a new park within um, the Lutwich area, but we've had other recent neighbourhood plans, such as around Dutton Park Fairfield, for example, or Kangaroo Point Peninsula, where new public parks haven't been included despite increased densification and, and rezoning for high density development. So there's a problem here where it costs the administration so much money to deliver new public green space in inner city areas, in areas where land is valued highly, um, that we're falling behind on our green space targets. And I guess my broad concern here is that we've seen the administration announce one or two modest acquisitions, but it, it's going nowhere near enough, far enough to address the chronic shortage of public green space we're seeing in inner city areas. Part of the reason we were able to afford this land is because it was identified for parkland before it was upzoned, whereas in other parts of the city we've upzoned sites that rapidly increase their value, and that makes it much more expensive to buy them back. Um, so I, I guess I'm quite supportive of this, but I'm, I'm really concerned about the broader trend we're seeing here. where. Um, in suburbs like Woolloongabba, Kangaroo Point, Dutton Park, etc., we are not providing enough new public green space to cater for our growing population. And I think it's important that the chair acknowledges that rather than um, seeking to paint a picture of everything's fine, we're building new parks, don't worry about it, when actually we're falling well behind our own targets in the, and desired standards of service in the city plan. The desired standards of service are very clear about how much public green space needs to be provided per 1,000 residents or per a certain number of employees, and we are not meeting those desired standards of service in terms of the provision of new public green space. So while this particular acquisition is to be commended, overall we're falling further and further behind, and every week goes by where this council doesn't bring more park acquisitions into this chamber, we're falling further behind. And so I hope this chamber understands and recognises that one house or a couple of lots here and there is not enough to address this issue. We need to drastically increase the amount of land and the number of sites we're buying for parkland in inner city areas. It's not enough to just buy a house here or there. It's certainly not enough just to convert existing green spaces like Victoria Park. We actually need to create new public parks and buy more land. And, and I'm very concerned that that's not happening at the moment. Further speakers? Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak briefly on item A, and it's good to hear Councillor Three sort of agreeing with the administration for a change. Uh, I know he'll always try to make uh, or take uh, an example of something we're doing, and he sort of broadly supports to then go on to make a, another political point. But uh, the, the fact is that uh, there is a, a, a very understandable logic attached to this particular purchase. It's not, as he said, a case of this being identified before the upzoning, as the words that he used. Uh, this was all part of the Lutwich neighbourhood plan that all came out at the same time. So to his argument, uh, through you, Mr Chair, um, the, the upzoning, to use his words, occurred at the same time as the identification as the, as the need for the, the space. So it was consistent or, or complementary. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Will Councillor McLaughlin take a question? Councillor McLaughlin, we oh, take a question. Oh, sure. I'll <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, Thanks. we will. Thank you for that. So just for my understanding, was this particular site zoned for high-density development or was the process to zone it from residential to parkland? Uh, so the answer to your question, Councillor Shree, is that the Lutwich neighbourhood plan identified an area where upzoning could uh, or should apply because of its, uh, its, uh, uh, its proximity to a transport corridor. That was a universally accepted plan either side of Lutwich Road. As a consequence of, of that Lutwich neighbourhood plan, it also identified an area that would be necessary for provision of a park, the area where the, the park is being created. It was not upzoned for uh, medium or residential development. It is low residential development. That's uh, the blocks that, that are currently there, um, 10 blocks. So this creates a park of about 5,000 square metres. 
in an area of the north side that is, uh, is underdone in the provision of parks. That's the great thing about the, what used to be the priority infrastructure plan. Now, the, the, the LGIP, the local government infrastructure plan, is it identifies the need for public and open space uh, to provide for the offsets for uh, the increase in density that's occurring. So, look, this is the last parcel in, a, in, um, the, in the acquisition of several parcels. I think there are nine other parcels that have been acquired, all in negotiation with the owners of those blocks. It was identified nearly 10 years ago as the location for a park. This was the last uh, holdout site uh, that is now being resumed, and it will allow for a, a rapid uh, creation of a new park. I know the, the work has been done to design the park already, uh, and as soon as this uh, block uh, has been brought into council ownership, um, I'm, I know that the plan is a, a, a shovel ready, ready to go and put a, a great new park on the north side of the city in the, Ham in the Hamilton Ward for the time being, uh, but we'll see what happens with boundary changes. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Cooper. Thank you very much, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I rise to speak to item C, uh, the end of the road lease at 1231A Brunswick Street, New Farm. Uh, I just wanted to respond um, to some comments made by Councillor Cumming uh, and suggested that uh, Council had failed to interest the market uh, in the lease. Uh, and he said, I quote from him, uh, Councillor Cumming that is, we don't know if it's a good deal for the ratepayer, unquote. Well, there actually is quite a bit of information provided in the submission. Some of it is commercial and confidence, of course, Mr Chair, but it's there for uh, all councillors to read uh, as to the criteria that was put forward by council uh, in determining what was or not was not a good deal for council. So I, I completely reject uh, those comments made by Councillor Cumming. I also note that perhaps Councillor Cumming is unaware of this specific location. It's an old ferry terminal. Uh, so it is a repurposed building uh, which had very significant um, limitations. Uh, there was a development application that went through and there were specific conditions of how that uh, building would operate. Uh, so basically it has approved hours to operate from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and that includes delivery and unloading. So if you're trying to run a business, a small, in fact, very, very small business, uh, you do have to take into consideration the limitations that this would place on you. And of course, uh, we understand that uh, this proprietor would be seeking to run their business and run it successfully, so there would be some limitations. And in fact, the actual dimensions of that site are also worth noting. So the lease area A is 43 square metres, as an estimate of 43 square metres, so not a large facility. And then licence area A and trustee lease area B is 71 square metres, again, as an estimate of those sizes. So this is not a large facility. It is operating as a coffee shop, and I believe they also sell uh, pre-packaged snacks. It is not a venue for people to have significant and large uh, events in this specific location. It is really a very convenient, a very attractive little spot, uh, but certainly not one where there are a whole lot of options for the proposed um, tenant to to make a significant return on their investment. So council officers uh, took this out to tender uh, on, and it went out uh, and, and there was an offer for a lease to go up to eight years. We actually advertised it um, on our tender portal. So it went out on the portal on the 19th of April, 2019, as well as in the courier mail in the public tenders section. Uh, so we put that out and then we closed the RFP on the 24th of May. And in fact, we actually got some, um, some comments about it uh, in one of the uh, Quest papers, City North News actually talked about it. So uh, I think that's pretty good advertising uh, as well as the paid advertising that council undertook. So I completely reject the comments made by Councillor Cumming. I think that that was uh, ill-informed. I note he doesn't seem to be very supportive of small business while we on this side of the chamber are incredibly passionate about the people that certainly I think drive our economy as a uh, 
as a city. Uh, we think this is an excellent uh, outcome. We really look forward to the tenant continuing to deliver great services for local community, uh, and Councillor Cummings' comments, I believe, were ill-informed. Thank you very much, Mr Chair. Further speakers? There being none, Lord Mayor. Uh, I'll now put the resolution. Um, firstly, on item A, all those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. And on items B and C, all those in favour say aye. Aye. And to the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Called by Councillor Cummings and Councillor Strunk. Eyes to my right and nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Councillors, can I please have silence? We have a debut reading of the results. Please read the clerks. Please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 20 in favour, one against and five abstentions. The ayes have it. Well done. Please return to your seats. Councillors, the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee report, please. The Deputy Mayor. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 13th of August 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Davis, that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee, uh, excuse me, Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 13th of August 2019, be adopted. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Last week's presentation was in our 2019 INUS Global Games Brisbane. I'm hoping that everybody in the chambers is very aware of this very large elite sporting event that is coming to Brisbane in October to focus on those spectacular athletes and their sporting events that may have an intellectual impairment. It's on from the 12th to 19th of October, which is only just Eight weeks away, I think, if we're counting down seniors travel to seven weeks away. It's held once every four years, and this is the first time that's taking place in the Asia-Pacific region. So we are absolutely thrilled to have this incredible event here in Brisbane. More than 1,000 competitors from over the world going for gold, 37 countries committed already. We're hoping we're going to hit 50 in total. Countries like Belgium, Ecuador, Egypt, Hong Kong, Iceland, Mali, Mexico, Switzerland and USA. And of course, China is going to be here for the first time this year as well. So we have got uh, 10 sports that athletes are going to be competing in. Athletics, basketball, cricket, cycling, road and track. 
futsal, rowing, indoor and outdoor, swimming, table tennis, taekwondo and tennis. The athletic swimming and table tennis are internationally sanctioned events, so therefore they're pathways to the Paralympics and therefore very highly attended, so the competition is going to be very, very high. It's being hosted by the Global Games Sporting Company. Um, Robin and Greg and the team are doing an absolutely amazing job. We're very proud to have sponsored them with a cash sponsorship of 300 k from council, 150,000 k from the Lord Mayor's Charitable Trust, and about $1.7 million in kind between council and Brisbane Marketing. So we have also just announced re recently the Next Gen Sporting Gen Chance grants, which are from 200 to $1,000 for scholarships for those elite athletes of up to $1,500. So we're looking forward to those Brisbane resident athletes with an intellectual impairment being able to represent their school, city, region, state, or potentially Australia at the Ines Games in Brisbane as well. So um, thank you very much to the Lord Mayor's Charitable Trust and to Brisbane Marketing for getting on board as well. Um, 12th to the 19th of October, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. We're going to have some keynote speakers out here because we will have a sports summit on for the two days before the start. Andrew Parsons from the International Paralympic Committee will be here, Kate Palmer, our Chief Executive Officer of Sport Australia, and Leon Anderson, Australian CEO of Paralympics as well. So the opening ceremony is a parade through Queen Street Mall down to an opening ceremony in King George Square on the 12th of October. I hope that all councillors will advertise it to their residents and get them along to support these fantastic athletes as well. Last week we also had two petitions, um, both of them to do with our bus stop upgrades and removal program that we're doing across Brisbane. Brisbane City Council has nearly 6,000 or over 6,000 bus stops. Um, we are working hard toward disability compliance with those bus stops. Some of those bus stops we will never be getting disability compliance on and we'll be working through that with the federal government in the legislation. As we rolled out this program, um, we are working with TransLink as well because they saw the opportunities of some amalgamation of bus stops as well, when bus stops were within 150 or to less than 200 metres of each other um, along busy routes, that they may be able to get some efficiencies on bus stop removals as well. The two that we had before us last week, the first one was the Milsom Street bus stop removal. Um, there was a miscommunication with the appointed contractor. The removals were supposed to be signposted there and then consultation done with the residents around that immediate area for the removal. This wasn't done before the removal actually occurred. So the j pole was reinstated at the site straight away and the bus stop returned to its former use. Can I thank Councillor Cunningham for her representations? She brought that uh, issue to my attention very quick smart so we could get that bus stop reinstated and made sure that the consultation occurred straight away. What we did hear clearly from residents is there still is a lot of seniors in that area around that bus stop that does like that bus stop a little bit closer to where their residents are than further down the street. So as such, the bus stop will be reinstalled to its original location and now we will do the upgrade with the shelter and the DDA compliance. The Blunder Road bus stop removal was slightly different. Again, this one was about the access and accessibility. Um, this bus stop was relocated on Blunder Road. It had buses picking up passengers in the middle of a signalised crossing. And I do realise that that was closer to the RVO site at Durack than where it's there at the moment. But I don't think anybody could agree that it's appropriate um, to, make, to get residents picked up in the middle of a signalised crossing via a bus. So therefore, with the accessibility upgrade, um, came around to the solution to relocate it to make sure that we did make it disability compliant, particularly for those senior residents at RVO Duracara as well. So it was located 100 metres down the road in a much safer location. Um, some of these residents are not happy, and I do understand that about this um, relocation, but I do hope that the local councillor and my response back to them well is uh, listened to that Durac is serviced by Council Cavs program and that the residents can access that throughout the week as well um, if they've been inconvenienced by the relocation. Councillor Griffiths was consulted and did not agree. Um, councillor Strunk was also consulted but did not provide a response. I'll leave the debate to the chamber. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? 
Councillor Cook. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to enter the debate on item B, the petition requesting the inbound bus stop 4978 located at Milsom Street at Bottomley Park, Norman Park, be immediately reinstated by council with a shelter. Mr Chair, uh, these petitions were initiated by myself as the local councillor. Um, they were signed by 60 signatories uh, after I door knocked the area, uh, the vast majority of whom live in the Morningside and Cooper wards. Mr Chair, my residents signed this petition after this LNP council unilaterally removed this stop with no consultation and no notification to either myself as the local councillor nor to the directly impacted residents. If this sounds familiar, Mr Chair, it is because just a few weeks ago uh, we were talking about the unilateral installation of garden beds with dead plants at the Corso, uh, again with no consultation and no notification. Mr Chair, here we are again, another backflip by this unelected LNP Lord Mayor and LNP Council. As the Leader of the Opposition has said, the backflips just keep coming, and it is not until Labor and the media shine a light on these issues that the LNP take action. Mr Chair, they take action in circumstances where they should have known better. It is not for us to give the Lord Mayor a call, as he seems to think, and ask nicely for action. If any councillor on this side of the chamber, probably with the exception of Councillor Toomey, has had success um, with that strategy, please let me know. It sounds like Councillor Cunningham in these circumstances uh, has, which is fantastic um, for her. That certainly hasn't been uh, my experience. Any issue I have taken to the Lord Mayor or relevant chairs seems to be the green light for dragging the chain a bit slower or providing a half-baked response which never really answers the questions that are asked. I know that this is also the case when the media asks questions of this administration. Sometimes they don't get a response at all. Sometimes they even get a door slammed order, in their Chair. face, Point quite literally, you, Mr Adams. Chair. Could we bring the um, pre-written speech back to the petition, which is the Milsom Street bus stop? As, as always, councillors are expected to remain on topic. Councillor Cook. Uh, thank you. I didn't know that it was an issue to have a pre-prepared speech or to do my homework, Mr Chair, but I'm, I'm sorry to, if that's inconvenient to Councillor Adams uh, with her folder of pre-written speeches over there. Um, I know, Mr Chair, that this latest backflip has seen the reinstating of this bus stop and logic has prevailed but not before causing considerable distress to local residents who contacted both myself and Councillor Cunningham about this issue. Uh, three separate council bus services operate on Milsom Street, Mr Chair, and the bus stop is in front of the home of the East Rugby Club. Mr Chair, this bus stop should never have been removed, and now ratepayers are picking up the bill, which is thousands of dollars of ratepayer funds again wasted in this latest bungle. This LNP administration is ripping out bus stops across the city, a basic essential service for the suburbs. Who knows, Mr Chair, how many more there are across the city? Um, I know that Councillor Cunningham called this the mysterious case of the disappearing bus stop. Uh, Mr Chair, there was nothing mysterious about it. But I do thank Councillor Cunningham for also supporting this reinstatement, which obviously benefits the residents both in my ward and in hers. Uh, Mr Chair, I just want to finish by putting on record some of the community feedback about this removal. Uh, Gordon says, the bus travelling ratepayers and residents are not happy with council decisions to eliminate random bus stops and making it inconvenient. Couldn't agree more, Gordon. Fiona says, thanks to everyone who spoke up about this, it's so weird that a bus stop just disappears. Not as weird as the BCC saying it was a miscommunication, though. Adele says, Convenient bus stops are hugely important to Brisbaneites. Don't ever remove them without consulting the locals first. But I think Alan should have the last word. He simply says incompetence. And that's where I'll leave it, Mr Chair. LNP equals incompetence. Further speakers? Councillor Griffiths. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Mr Chair. And there must be a theme today because um, I also want to speak on um, on, on how we're going with bus stops, and in particular the bus. Uh, this is item C, the bus stop as it relates to um, uh, bus stop 70 on uh, Blunder Road at Durack. Um, this has been uh, one that's caused great uh, consternation for residents of Aveo, out, at, uh, out in my area, who use this bus stop primarily um, to get to their local shopping centre. 
And uh, Council apparently has done a great job in terms of um, making the bus stop disability compliant, but at the same time we've made it less accessible for people who actually want to use the bus stop to get to the shops. So these people, these residents from Aveo are now telling me that they have to walk further, that it is harder for them to get to the bus stop, and that it's more inconvenient for them to get to the bus stop. They didn't want the bus stop uh, placed um, down the hill. They wanted the bus stop kept where it was. And one of the biggest problems with this whole um, project, the whole way this has been uh, run, has been the lack of consultation. Because this is one of those bus stops that's on the boundary of two wards. And because you're on the boundary of two wards, you don't get consulted if your ward is across the street. Uh, so those residents across the road didn't get consulted, didn't get included, um, and we didn't take into account their concerns. So it wasn't until the bus stop was being reconstructed that, that we actually found out that the bus stop um, was going to be moved. So it was too late to take action. Now I think that's really one of the um, one of the downsides of the way the administration is working at the moment is that they work on these very strict ward boundaries and it seems that we can't communicate across that boundary um, to the benefit of residents of Brisbane. And surely that's who we're here for, are the residents of Brisbane. So I wasn't consulted, all the residents at Aveo weren't consulted, and what we got is this outcome with hundreds of people signing this petition. And they're signing it because they want the bus stop reinstated. And I think it's reasonable to have the bus stop reinstated. But no, this council won't do it. Because it meets compliance. So we're actually the very people that we say we're serving are the very people that we um, aren't serving. We aren't looking after our residents in terms of using this bus stop and using public transport. What's even worse is the uh, residents, and I went and had a look at this on the weekend, were telling me how uneven the footpath is to this um, new bus stop. I just uh, don't understand why we can't at least even make the, um, the footpath um, function so that they can catch this, uh, catch this bus. It's, um, it is really disappointing that this administration is so set on meeting compliance, but actually not interested in delivering for residents. Uh, in terms of the residents out there to June and all the residents who signed the petition, um, I said that I'd mention you and mention the fine work that you've done in putting this petition together. I, I've talked about some of the issues in terms of them getting um, their partners, their husbands, their wives onto the buses. And unfortunately, this council and this administration aren't concerned with listening. They're just concerned with um, going through the bureaucratic process, um, not consulting properly, and hence delivering results that don't meet the community's needs. I think um, a much better solution could have been reached with this with a bit of common sense. And unfortunately, common sense wasn't applied in this situation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh... Thank you, Mr. Chair. Listen, I just want to clarify uh, an issue that uh, was raised by uh, Councillor uh, Adams in regards to my commenting on this particular petition. Um, I, I, I was fairly sure that I had made comment, and so I've, uh, briefed, I just texted my uh, uh, ward advisor, and she indicates to me that we, we made uh, comment on this petition, um, on the recommendation, uh, about three to four weeks ago. But I will um, chase that up uh, tomorrow and uh, send it off to Councillor Adams, uh, too, for her consideration, uh, maybe at next uh, next uh, week's meeting, and uh, maybe she can then clarify her original statement. Thank you. Further speakers? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. And um, I think Councillor Cook said it um, very clearly that um, the first thing that she goes to is the media when there's an issue about that. Um, I would have loved to have heard from Councillor Cook, but I did hear from Councillor Cunningham straight away, and it was reinstated before petition, before it got to the media. 
um, or any of that. And it is a process that's worked through. Maybe she does need to speak to um, Councillor Cassidy. He did contact me very soon, not in the chamber. Again, hasn't been for most of the afternoon. Um, but Councillor Cassidy Point of order, contacted Mr. me Chair. very quickly. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Just for the stated record, I wanted to note that the Lord Mayor also hasn't been in the chamber okay, for well, most of the afternoon. Point of order. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Glad to see the ALP and Green Labor Alliance is working very, very well. Um, Councillor Cassidy worked through the process. We're still working through the process of what's happened with his bus stop, but he contacted me. And uh, we have been communicating back and forth about how we deal with the concerns around one of his bus stops as well. But going to the media is definitely not um, the way to get things resolved. And it's not the reason why there was a change on this site. We consulted, as I said, there was a lack of consultation. They moved too quickly. We consulted. It's, it was reinstated. The J-Pole was put back as soon as it became apparent to us as well. I do need to just say, though, it's very interesting that when Car Councillor Cook, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, when Councillor Cook is so quite concerned about getting the uh, the locals to have a say, that they make sure that they get the national ALP organiser, Lisa Collier, to have her say about what she thinks on the bus stop as well. Very, very convenient. Um, with result, with regards to the Avio Durac site. I have to say I do absolutely not agree with Councillor Griffiths that he thinks it's reasonable, but you know, I think that team thinks many things are reasonable that I don't think are reasonable, um, that it's reasonable that the bus stop go back to where it was, in the middle of a pedestrian crossing for seniors to hop on a bus in the middle of a traffic signalisation. The first I've heard a raise from any local councillor that the footpath needs to be addressed heading to that bus stop. It's not part of the program that we instigate the footpath for 100 metres up to that bus stop, but I'm sure it's something that they can look at with the Suburban Enhancement Fund as well. Um, what we did was make sure that when we knew it was not reasonable to keep the bus stop where it was, that we worked to the closest site possible to the existing bus stop that could be made safe and accessible. And what I think is reasonable, that we have provided a safe and accessible bus stop for the residents of that retirement village. And of course, we also have council cabs if they require to get to their um, shopping um, centre, their closest shopping centre. Um, I'm not sure about Durac. I know some suburbs have twice a week, some suburbs have three times a week. But it's something rather than running the hysteria that maybe they should go and sit with their residents and talk about how it's now safe and accessible and what they do need to support them to uh, move to the shops and explain the council cab process as well. <clears throat> All those in favour of the resolution uh, say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Infrastructure Committee report, please. Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 13th of August 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by <coughs> excuse me, Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Huang, that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 13th of August 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, uh, at committee last week we had a presentation on Chatsworth Boundary and Samuel Roads. Uh, Councillor Griffiths was an apology. We did miss you, Councillor Griffiths, uh, and we had two petitions. So, um, with respect to the presentation, uh, both Chatsworth and Boundary Roads are classified as suburban roads. The intersection carries approximately 31,000 vehicles per day, and between August 2007 and July 2017, QPS web crash data showed that there had been 33 vehicles recorded. Uh, as having crashes resulting in hospitalisation, uh, medical treatment or injury, including one fatality uh, in 2015. So a very significant um, record of incidents in that specific location. Uh, the majority of those crashes involved motorists turning right from Chatsworth Road or Samuel Street and colliding with oncoming traffic, where people obviously are becoming impatient after having to wait. So during morning and afternoon peak hours, the intersection operates at peak capacity. So it's 
It's got no capacity left uh, in order to accommodate those sorts of movements. So there's significant congestion in that location. And by 2031, it's forecast to be double that of the current queue lengths uh, with a 50% increase in delay times. Now, I know that Councillor Shree always says, um, you know, that this is the price that we must pay for congestion. Uh, but one of the real impacts of congestion is that people do things that perhaps, if the intersection operated better, they wouldn't do. They take risks, uh, they look for gaps in traffic, and they will uh, certainly, I think, unfortunately, I think that hurrying uh, in their destination is more important than safety. And this, unfortunately, is a good example of what we do see in this specific location. So this upgrade particularly will control uh, right turn movements. The slip lane will be removed. There'll be additional lane capacity installed on Chatsworth Road and Samuel Street. There'll be a dedicated right turn lane on Chatsworth Road into Boundary Road with fully controlled arrows on both Chatsworth Road and Samuel Street. Uh, we had to do some resumptions for this project to occur, and we have been on ongoing communications with those impacted landowners. We expect completion uh, late this calendar year, so we had to resume one full and two partial resumptions of property, uh, which of course does take some time. I just would like to once again reiterate that this is a safety project uh, that is really based on the significant um, significant amount of vehicles that are utilising this intersection and certainly has been very strongly supported by the local community. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on items B and C. Um, it was interesting to hear um, Councillor Cooper's comments around the, um, the fact that when intersections aren't well designed or people have to wait too long, they start taking risks. And I think that's definitely relevant to both the petitions, the one requesting speed limit reductions and the one requesting a zebra crossing. Because what I see frequently in my electorate is that residents get fed up waiting for a break in the traffic and they, and they have to rush across, um, taking their life in their, their hands. And it's, it's been really sad in my electorate because we've had a couple of pedestrian deaths over the last couple of years and there hasn't been anywhere near enough action from this administration to seriously acknowledge the safety concerns we're seeing throughout the inner south side. Um, and the dismissive response to repeated requests for lowering, lowering the speed limits on Montague Road, I think, is one classic example of that. Even where there are lights the, now at Vulture Montague and at Jane Montague, the wait times for pedestrians are very long, and that means pedestrians sometimes jaywalk. Um, as many of you will have experienced, the, it, it can be quite frustrating when you just miss the phasing of the signals and um, you get there to the button just a second too late and then you have to wait a whole cycle of the lights before the pedestrian signal triggers and that, that can be a wait of several minutes. And when you have multiple waits like that along a single pedestrian journey, it really does start to add up. But particularly with Montague Road, the concerns are about um, the fact that there are no safe crossings along that corridor but also that cyclists who are using the corridor don't feel safe sharing that roadway with busy, noisy vehicles, particularly larger trucks. Um, but al al also that the, the current speed environment forecloses any opportunities to create an active travel precinct along that corridor. The council administration has stated quite clearly that it wants Montague Road to become a more vibrant um, street with more activity at ground level. There's talk in the neighbourhood plan of things like footpath dining and ground level retail. But none of that's viable when Montague Road feels like a, a busy, noisy through corridor. And the thing is, Montague Road doesn't really lead to anywhere else. It doesn't lead to another suburb or uh, it's, it's kind of the end of the peninsula. So it leads to a few residential apartments and a few businesses, but it's not a major arterial road. So it's, it's not clear to me why it's so important for traffic to be able to travel at 60 kilometres an hour on that last, last leg of the journey. Um, my concerns about the speed limit process have been aired several times in this chamber, but I thought they might be in, of interest to some new councillors in this, in this chamber who haven't been through the speed limit review process before. Essentially what happens is that council um, will say, okay, we're going to investigate the speed limit um, for this area, we'll then 
it will then um, take readings on what the average speeds are along the corridor, how many vehicles are using the corridor, what the neighbouring land uses are, et cetera, um, and also look at things like crash history. And eventually the council will, will conclude that, oh, look, right now vehicles are travelling at a certain speed and the road corridor feels like a 60 kilometre an hour road, so we're not going to make any changes. Now, Councillor Cooper has recently noted that the speed limit review process has changed to allow council greater flexibility. But that hasn't yet translated to better outcomes on the ground in my electorate. Um, Montague Road is a classic example where we want to make a deliberate shift away from active transport. And I think this is, this is really where the Deputy Mayor and, and the Lord Mayor also need to take some responsibility because this is not just about the infrastructure portfolio. This is about in encouraging active transport. But while the speed limit review process is so geared towards motor vehicle transport and the needs of pedestrians and cyclists are deprioritised and ignored largely, we're going to continue to see the speed limit review process recommend high speeds which are not appropriate for that particular area. It's, um, it's been a source of great frustration to many residents when all the residents in that area support lower speed limits. The small, small businesses along the corridor support small, lower speed limits. The developers in that area support lower speed limits. The local councillor supports lower speed limits. West End Community Association, Kurilpa Futures and other local residents groups all support lower speed limits. Um, but for some reason, this council is using a, a bureaucratic and an ill-adapted review process to decide that the speed limit doesn't need to be reduced. And that's very, very frustrating. Um, I know that the speed limit will be looked at again more closely when the lights for the intersection of Victoria and Montague are, are eventually installed. But I wanna emphasize that it would not be satisfactory to drop the speed limit to 50 kilometers an hour. The residents who put this petition together told me that they were very disappointed that previous petitions for a 40 kilometer hour speed limit had been rejected. And they thought that if they just asked for 50, they might have a better chance of getting something over the line. But even that doesn't seem to have been the case here. So when we do get round to again, looking closely at this corridor's speed limit, I really urge um, the relevant chair and the mayor to, to not just think about how the road is being used currently, but think about what it could be like if we transform that corridor into an active transport precinct where cars are deprioritized where developers and their big trucks just have to slow down and, and, and take it a bit slower, take it a bit easier, rather than roaring through what is now a built up residential and commercial precinct. In terms of the, um, the, the other petition for a pedestrian crossing on Jane Street, this again is a straightforward request. The, the officers are willing to acknowledge that a pedestrian crossing is necessary there. The problem really is one of funding where this council continues to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on road, road widenings and major intersection upgrades and then um, is far too um, frugal with its cash when it comes to minor local pedestrian safety upgrades. I think in this case it would be quite um, simple to install a zebra crossing and it wouldn't even cost that much money. But part of the problem is that council's traffic engineers are still car obsessed. Um, they do not understand or have the skills or the expertise to make that transition to an active transport precinct. They've quite clearly been indoctrinated into a mentality of car is king and, and they lack the ability to think outside the box and recognise that in, in an area like Jane Street where there are so many high density developments and there's so many people walking around and cycling that installing zebra crossings is a, a totally appropriate response. And I think it's really disappointing that although the mayor and the deputy mayor have expressed some support for active transport, that doesn't yet seem to have filtered down to change the culture of the engineers and the uh, council officers working within the bureaucracy, because they're still cl very clearly operating on a mentality of prioritising motor vehicle transport at the expense of pedestrian safety. Further speakers, Councillor Cunningham. Chair, I rise to speak on item A. This $10.3 million upgrade improves safety for all road users, including pedestrians and cyclists, as well as improves traffic flow and reduces congestion around the intersection. 
As many of us know, the intersection is adjacent to a thriving local hub, the Camp Hill Marketplace. And as Councillor Cooper mentioned, our own council data shows around 31,000 cars use this busy juncture every day. I'm pleased to see work finally getting underway to improve it. Back in 2015, Council identified this intersection had some safety risks and was at nearing or at capacity in peak periods and would be above capacity by 2031. In fact, without an upgrade, without planning for the future, the queue lengths would have doubled and there would have been a 50% increase in delay times. Residents know this intersection has also had a number of bus routes that go through it, both in peak and non-peak periods. So when you have a popular bus route and bus stops nearby, it doesn't take much work to realise there are lots of pedestrians navigating their way across multiple lanes. Combine that with the local shoppers and people dining out at Camp Hill shops, and council data shows there are at least 100 pedestrians using it every day. So importantly, one of the major benefits of this work is an improvement to pedestrian safety. It does this by removing the left, turn, the left turn slip lane from Samuel Street into Boundary Road and through signal phasing improvements, providing greater separation between pedestrians and vehicles. Now, all these improvements will benefit residents, be those pedestrians, drivers or cyclists. But let's take into consideration some more important data. As is always the case, council traffic engineers model and plan for these significant road projects. Now, I'm not against cyclists, I want that to be clear. In fact, I support all modes of transport, active transport, and will always support more cycleways where they are needed. But on average, Council's very own data shows less than four bikes travel through the intersection, not hourly, but daily. Let me repeat that. The data collected during a normal period in July, not in school holidays, had an average of less than four bikes a day. Now, for argument's sake, let's say the traffic engineers got it wrong, okay? And we did a bit of a radical extrapolation and we saw a doubling of cyclists in that intersection. Still, that's less than 10 cyclists a day. So my point here is that council experts through data collection have shown that this route is not one that cyclists are currently regularly choosing. It's therefore not surprising that it's not identified as a primary cycle route for the area under the Principal Cycle Network Plan, which Council has collaborated with the state on. Although not a primary route, cyclists still benefit from the upgrade. Through the widening of the footpath from 1.5 to 3 metres on the southern side of Samuel Street and on the Chatsworth Road side, the footpath width is increased from 1.2 to 1.5 metres. So this upgrade has actually balanced the needs of all users. It's improving safety for the modes of transport that use the intersection the most, which based on data is cars and pedestrians, while still ensuring the cyclists who use the intersection are also benefiting. In summary, Mr. Chair, I wanna commend the administration for getting on with the job of delivering this intersection upgrade. My thanks to Councillor Cooper and the officers for bringing an informative presentation to committee last week. This side of the chamber is planning for the future and recognising the need to maintain Brisbane as a well-connected and modern city. Further speakers? There being none, Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Chair. And I really do uh, commend Councillor Cunningham. She uh, came along to committee the other day. Uh, she sat there and I think that she really um, took the opportunity to learn more about her particular, uh, particular project in her ward. And I think it really shows what a responsible uh, person she is. She was very well informed about what it actually meant for her community. And those are the people that she is absolutely passionate about. Um, about representing very, very well. So thank you very much to Councillor Cunningham. Uh, plus she's just a lovely person really anyway. So uh, I'd like to make a couple of comments with respect to the uh, items that were put forward by Councillor Shree. Uh, he suggested that council was dismissive. Uh, he suggested that um, pedestrians regularly cross against lights and that's undoubted that we do see people. Uh, we did the move safe work across the whole of the city and there are people that don't obey uh, 
obey the rules. They, they cross when they choose to, and that is incredibly disappointing. And certainly the uh, video evidence that we had show that people are making a choice to actually cross without complying with uh, the road rules. And that's something that I would discourage and I would believe all councillors would discourage. And I would encourage councillors to remind people to be patient. Uh, and certainly if there's infrastructure in place, they should be utilising it. Uh, Councillor Shree suggested there were no safe crossings along Montague uh, Road. He said that there was, got, uh, there was discussion about having a vibrant culture along there, but while it is operating as it is, he doesn't foresee that this is a possibility. Um, I would put to you that, Councillor Shree, uh, when you lay on the road outside of a hospital and you cause traffic delays uh, and you don't care about people who are trying to, particularly ambulances, trying to get into a hospital Point of order, uh, in Mr. Chair. Hour, Point of order, Councillor Shree. Claim to be misrepresented. It's noted. Uh, Councillor Cooper. I would put to you, Mr Chair, that you damage your credibility very significantly uh, if you say that people uh, need to do these sorts of things and put these measures in place when you yourself uh, do as you please uh, and you countenance that. You think that that is so, illegitimate. Uh, Councillor Cooper, can you please address comments to Councillor Shree in the third person? and the ones Absolutely. To Through you, Mr Chair. And uh, I that last statement was to me, and I've, I've never lied. lied and I apologise, Mr Chair, because no, I know you. you would never do such a thing uh, in any way, shape or form. So it is something that council officers take incredibly seriously. Uh, they investigate whether it is appropriate to put in these facilities. And I completely and totally dispute the comments that were made by Councillor Shri, where he said that officers don't have the skills outrageous, I think that is an outrageous comment on his behalf, said that they have been indoctrinated. I also dispute that. I think that is an outrageous slur on council officers and should be withdrawn. Uh, and he said that council officers believe cars are king. Uh, all of those statements I believe to be false statements uh, representing the views of council officers. I think that they are people that note that mobility isn't about one mode or another. It is about a whole range of options. Every single one of us is a pedestrian. Every single one of us. Whether you drive a car, you ride a bike, whether you catch public transport, we all walk. And I think that that comment uh, really is a poor reflection on council officers, and I am absolutely uh, totally in opposition to the statements made, made by Councillor Shree. I think that he should be ashamed of himself speaking about the technical experts who provide, I think, such diligent service to all of us in this chamber, indeed to all of the residents of this city. I'd also like to say that uh, the re request for a reduction to the speed limit uh, actually recommended that we do undertake a formal speed limit review to determine, because there have been changes in that location, whether there are some uh, changes that can be made. And to dispute the comments that there are no safe crossings along Montague Road, I would just like to list the safety improvements that we have undertaken on the corridor. We've put two pedestrian refuges islands on Montague Road. We've put um, curb ramps, we've put footpath sections and signage. Uh, we have also undertaken work with uh, Victoria and Skinner from Montague Road to Beatty Road, putting a conversion to a one-way configuration. So that removes all turns out of Victoria and Skinner Street and right turns into Victoria and Skinner Street from Montague Road. So those are improvements undoubtedly. We've also Point of order, December, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Councillor Cooper, take a question. Councillor, will you take a question? Happy to do so, Mr Chair. So please proceed, Councillor Shree. I'm genuinely baffled. Like, I, obviously, I was a big advocate of that um, minor improvement to Victoria Street, but I don't see how that made it any easier to cross Montague Road. And I'm concerned if you think, through you, Mr Chair, if Councillor Cooper thinks that that's a pedestrian safety improvement, do you actually, through you, Mr Chair, do you actually think that that improved the safety for people crossing at Victoria Street, Montague Road intersection? Councillor Cooper. Uh, I believe, uh, through you, Mr Chair, that changes to the uh, function and operation of Montague Road do absolutely make that corridor safer for all users. Uh, I'd also like to go on and say that we've upgraded uh, in December of last year the intersection of Montague Road and Vulture Street. That was being signalised, so we've put in pedestrian crossings, 
pedestrian crossings. Uh, we put on-road cycle lanes that have been installed. So we're providing additional crossing options on Montague Road. And then in this year's budget, we have committed to funding for the signalisation of Victoria and Montague Street. So the comments made by Councillor Shri are not correct. There is plenty of evidence to suggest that Council has done significant works in this location. And it also says uh, that we will be happy to review the speed limit in, with respect to that location. Councillor Shri also said that uh, council officers um, were saying that there should be a, crossings, a crossing with respect to Jane Street. Uh, that's not correct. The officers uh, have reviewed the web crash data. They've looked at that location. They say that some people do cross there, uh, but they note, and it's in, the, it's in the petition, they say there is not a record of high enough consistent pedestrian volume to install a zebra crossing. So his comments are completely in contradiction with the recommendation made by the council officers, uh, and I uh, grossly, I grossly object to him trying to uh, rewrite history as he is wont to do. So uh, with respect to these two petitions, uh, council officers, I believe, have done significant investigation. They are always keen to try and make our environment all across the city in all 26 wards as safe as they can possibly be. And I do believe I do believe that we have an excellent track record with the Move Safe campaign of investing in safety for our pedestrians in particular in our city, because let's be honest, everyone is a pedestrian. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, Councillor Shree, you had a note of misrepresentation. Um, please um, Thanks, address Mr. Chair. misrepresentation. I'll, I'll, I'll keep you to the point. Um, Councillor Cooper made a borderline defamatory suggestion that I didn't care about emergency vehicle access and had been involved in protests that blocked ambulance access. And just to correct the record, I want to read from the news article at the time. A Queensland oh, police no, spokesperson no, um, said there was no Councillor issues Shree, with Councillor respect Shree, to public safety or- Councillor Shree, um, we really are trying to keep these sure, really I'm, crisp. And, and right? I literally just this one sentence, which is that there, there was no, no issues with respect to public safety or emergency vehicle access identified at the time of the protest. So if we're going to talk okay, about rewriting you, history. All right. Um, all, the, all right. All those who support the resolution say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the City Planning Committee report. Councillor Burke. Thanks, Mr Chair. I move the report of the City Planning Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 13th of August 2019, be adopted. Seconded, Mr Chairman. It's been moved by Councillor Burke, seconded by Councillor Toomey that the report of the City Planning Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 13th of August 2019 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Burke. Thanks very much, Mr Chairman. We had a fantastic presentation on the successful Village Precincts Projects Program uh, uh, from the officers, Mr Chairman. And obviously, uh, we've announced this year's uh, areas which are receiving the Village Precinct Projects, uh, but we had an update on the work that was undertaken in the last financial year for Sanford Road at Gaythorn, Kurragundi Road, Jindalee, Iota Street and Nala, Hamilton Road, Wavell Heights, the work that's continuing at Gympie Road, Aspley, and of course the work that's happening at Racecourse Road, Ascot. Um, Council also uh, is now in the process of doing work uh, and planning the works at Kenrose Street, Carina, Railway Parade, Dara, Station Road, Sunnybank, Waterworks Road in Ashgrove, uh, the Corso at Seven Hills, and finishing that uh, work there at Gympie Road. Uh, some of the great results, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, is we had a massive increase uh, in the overall aesthetics of these locations and the feedback from residents who came to many of the, the opening events that we had uh, or unveiling events that we had, Mr Chairman, uh, provided some really great feedback about how the shopping centres had been lifted. Uh, but the most telling thing, uh, Mr Chairman, is that post completion of the village precinct projects out there at Gaythorn, we went from 10 empty shops to four. Uh, and at Jindalee, we went from five down to two, Mr Chairman. So obviously, uh, people are voting with their feet, businesses are voting with their feet. They want to be in these locations where we're doing these projects because it does lift the foot traffic, it does lift the overall attendance at these locations, Mr Chairman, and that is what this administration is about, supporting small business, creating a city of neighbourhoods and making sure we have liberal communities that we can all enjoy, and I commend the committee report. Further speakers? There being none, I'll put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Environment, Plan uh, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, please. Councillor Hammond. 
Mr Chair, I move the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 13th of August 2019 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Hammond, seconded by Councillor Richards, so the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 13th of August 2019 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I'd like to give a quick summary of what has happened in our green space area over the last five months. But before I do that, I would like to acknowledge the hard work that Councillor David McLaughlin did prior to me taking over in the role. Um, and I'm absolutely honoured that I'm continuing the hard work that you started and we're now completing. In the last five months, I hear a lot of things in this place that we don't care about green space and, and providing places to, to see and do and to play in the area. Mr Chair, I'd like to give a quick summary. As I said, just in five months, um, this administration, under the very, very well-led um, leadership from our Lord Mayor, um, Lord Mayor Schrinner, the summit track at Mount Cutha was reopened. Multi-use games arena at O'Callaghan Park was completed. Simpsons Fall picnic area improvements and playscape was completed. Winton Barracks playground, um, again, completed. Constructions of fishing um, platforms at Mogul Ferry Park, um, Mag Street Park, Wavell Heights picnic facilities and new exercise equipment was completed. New Farm Park Promenade. I can't wait to go down and have a look at that, um, Councillor Howard. JC Slaughter Falls picnic area playscape, playscape completed. Boat ramp upgrades at Combsley, Street, Re uh, Combsley Recreational Reserve. Barber Road Park Bracken Ridge upgrade. Um, a Parlour Street Park Corinda upgraded. Sunberg Way Park Tagum again upgraded. Mount Cutha Botanical Gardens, all abilities path was completed. Um, and what a great new walkway and experience that is for our residents of Brisbane. Some of the other parks that have been upgraded. Grinstead Park Orderly, which at the moment is still in Marchant Ward, but could change. Um, Mr Chair, to your ward. So, yes, you're welcome. There is a great new upgrade in that particular area, area for you. Wally Tate Park at Roncorn, new outdoor gym. Raymont Park, um, Kangaroo Point, new outdoor gym. Fernie Grove Picnic Ground, Fernie Grove, multi-use games area and outdoor gym completed. Perry Park, Bowen Hills, New outdoor gym equipment in completed in June 2019. Um, the Pask Family Park in Rochdale, again, exercise equipment completed. Um, Cresthaven Park, Mansfield, exercise equipment completed, delivered. Wembley Park, Cooparoo, picnic area has been upgraded and delivered. CJ Greenfield Complex Park in Richlands, um, the upgrade, I know um, Councillor Strunk has been very happy about this, upgrade to the park and barbecues um, and better irrigation in the area. Lord Mayor, is, I mean, Dep sorry, Mr Chairman, if this is what our Lord Mayor, Adrian Trinner, can deliver in five short months, wait for it, Brisbane. There is still more to see and do in Brisbane with the green, with our, our commitment to our Greens, um, area and improving that across our city. I can't wait to see what is the future for Brisbane under this Lord Mayor, Adrian Trinner. Further speakers? There being none, I'll put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Field Services Committee. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Chair. I move that the report of the Field Services Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 13th of August 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Marks, that the report of the Field Services Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 13th of August 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, we had a very informative presentation on the revived Fashion Festival from the Manager of Waste and Resource Recovery at Field Services. And uh, as I know that you're very interested in fashion chair, I will let you know that this is my 2018 revived jacket. I hope that you are all observing that I am still reusing. And uh, can I say that uh, it was a great, great pleasure to, uh, to attend on Saturday morning. And 
It was really a beautiful day. We had it was it, I, it was the fourth of our revive uh, festivals, and I can say I think they just get better and better every time. But what I particularly liked was that Kim Bailey, who helped me choose this jacket, was waiting to get coffee, as was I. And she, Vicky, you're wearing the jacket. And, and I said, yes, I wear it often. She said, I've seen you on Facebook. So can I just say, it's fantastic that if you pop along to Revive, you're going to get a fashion statement that really will sort of last for years and years. Can I encourage everyone to do their bit to keep textiles out of landfill? And uh, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've been talking about uh, Revive now at committee and, and in the chamber for a couple of weeks. So if I can just recommend the report to the chamber. Thank you. Further speakers? There being none, I'll put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee. Councillor Maddock. Mr Chair, I move the report of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee meeting held on Tuesday, 13 August 2019 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Maddock, seconded by Councillor Cunningham, that the report of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 13th of August 2019 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Maddock. Further speakers? There being none, I'll put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Finance and Administration Committee. Councillor Allen. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Finance and Administration Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 13th of August 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor McLaughlin. The report of the Finance and Administration Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 13th of August 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, before moving on to the report, I just wanted to uh, respond to a question that was posed by Councillor Cumming in the committee meeting this morning. He uh, asked uh, what the cost of the My Resilient Schools program was, and I can advise that it's approximately $13,000. Now, uh, moving on to the report um, on recruitment trends, as you can appreciate, Council is a large organisation and recruitment is a, a key component of what we do. And so the, uh, the presentation touched upon the current recruitment context and background, the current recruitment approach and uh, future opportunities in recruitment. Um, given that we are a, a large recruiter, we have a, a dedicated team in Council that looks after this and uh, we undertake re recruitment for individual roles and also um, uh, we undertake recruitment where we may be filling a, a number of positions. So uh, in the case of things like um, library roles or apprenticeships, we might be looking to recruit a number of people at any point in time. Um, just to give a context of the scale of our recruitment activity, uh, since January 2018, We've managed nearly 2,000 employment offers and uh, processed 40,000 job applications. So uh, a very busy uh, section within council. Um, we continue to use not only sort of contemporary or um, and um, traditional methods of recruitment, the old uh, job ad, we, we still do those, but we also uh, do a range of things online. Um, as you'd be aware, we've got emerging technologies and emerging platforms with things like LinkedIn and Facebook that uh, provide a different dimension to our recruitment activities. Um, we tend to have two primary recruitment portfolios, namely engineering, technical and trades, and then the professional sector. And just to give you some insights into the kind of roles we recruit for, project managers, engineers, tradespeople, people who work in our cemeteries, librarians, urban planners, IT, legal, communications, admin, HR professionals. Uh, the list goes on and we've also got a, quite an extensive um, group of employment programs that we uh, seek to draw people into the organisation through. So um, it's quite a, a, a significant part of Council's business. We use quite a complex um, recruitment methodology now that we've got um, access to things like psychometric testing and uh, ultimately we will continue to, uh, to leverage the uh, technologies that are available to us to ensure that uh, Council's recruitment activities are efficient as possible and that we get the best possible recruits for the organisation. Thank you. Further speakers? There being none, I will put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. 
councillors. Are there any petitions? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I have a petition uh, for the installation of lights for Rody Road Dog Park. Uh, the petitioners are requesting lighting along the footpath uh, from Rody Road across to Remick Street at Stafford Heights. Councillor Allen. Mr Chair, I have a petition requesting that Council recite a bus stop in White Street, Wavell Heights to Embercastle Road. Councillor Strunk. Yes, Mr Chair. I have a petition from uh, 79 uh, Forest Lake uh, residents who are wanting the 118 service, bus service to be extended. Councillors, may I please have a petition, uh, a, a motion for the receipt of petitions, please. Yes, Mr Chair. I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Uh, second. It's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Strunk, that all petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, general business. Uh, councillors, are there any statements required as a result of a councillor conduct review panel order? Are there any matters of general business? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise uh, briefly to speak on uh, the Srinur administration's project to widen Waterworks Road. Uh, the Waterworks Road, uh, as we know it today, the, the path was actually cut out of the bush in, in uh, 1864 to service the uh, emerging and growing Brisbane area uh, to gain access to fresh water uh, out at Anogra Dam, or Anogra Reservoir as it's known today. Um, subsequently, that part of Ashgrove then became an orchard, uh, and then subsequently, after the orchard uh, waned around the 1920s, uh, it began to grow. And in 1925, uh, Ashgrove received town water. So, councillors, sorry, councillors, can you, I see a number of private conversations. Can they please be taken outside? Um, I know that. Um, the meeting has been going for a little while, but please allow Councillor Toomey the courtesy of being heard in silence. Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the pipe that was laid down in 1925 is uh, the pipe that we're actually currently replacing today. Uh, the construction method that was used at the time was a large steel pipe uh, that was laid into the ground and then protected uh, with a cement coating in situ. Today, the practice of replacing the pipe is very, very different. We use a plastic material and we use a plastic welder, uh, and it's done within the pit that's, that's put in place. Uh, I've gone out a number of times, uh, Mr Chair, late at night, because uh, the works are after hours. They start at nine and they finish at five, just to observe, just to see how the guys out there do it. And I have to say, uh, that I am thoroughly impressed with not only the craftsmanship but the coordination uh, of all those involved on site. For example, uh, last Thursday night I was on site in Stuart Road uh, in a small area of Ashgrove. Some of you might know it quite well. It's between Two Toast Cafe, where Chair, you and I often sit down and have one of the finest pizzas in Ashgrove. Uh, I'm, and aware of the the, I'm aware of the venue. And the, uh, the Hub Cafe, which uh, I know services a particularly good Italian coffee. Uh, and in that small area, uh, we had a number of services being worked on. We had the replacement of power poles, the reinstatement of a 33 kilovolt electrical cable, uh, the installation of a water main. Uh, we also had uh, Telstra on site doing uh, NBN. And of course, we had council officers and traffic controllers. And I have to say, as an observer standing on the side of the road outside the Hub Cafe, uh, watching all this going on in this small space, I believe at the time I said, this was like watching Swan Lake with excavators, trucks, elevators, elevated working platforms uh, as the performers. To say uh, that this was an outstanding uh, coordination and, and work would be an understatement. These, uh, these workmen were able to 
Sorry. And, and women, yes, there were some ladies on site. My apologies, Chair. Uh, these work persons uh, did an outstanding job. Uh, workers, work persons, political correctness never ends in this place, does it? Yes. All right, so stay on, stay on topic, hey? So stay on topic, hey? We'll... Um, it, was, it was an outstanding effort. Uh, and at that time, they're still letting the traffic go through, keeping in mind that, that this part of uh, Stuart Road is an on-ramp and an off-ramp for um, uh, the Met Road 5. So we couldn't close the road. Um, so with that, I, I express my um, sincere thanks and admiration for the work that had been done by the workers uh, in this space and uh, I, to the chair. And I just thought that tonight I would actually stand up and put it on the record. Um, it was flawless coordination for the work uh, that had been done uh, in that space. And I particularly want to thank, I did write it down here. I did particularly want to thank uh, the infrastructure team, CPO, uh, those on site who were with Energex, uh, the Telstra team who managed to make sure that the lights were still working, uh, QUU uh, for their flawless coordination. Um, I also would like to thank Councillor Cooper and the Lord Mayor for their uh, assistance in making this particular project possible. It's one that has been desired by my community for quite a long time, and it's uh, just one fantastic project that is going to make the Brisbane of tomorrow better than the Brisbane of today. Thank you, Chair. Further speakers? Okay, Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Listen, I just want to uh, rise and speak briefly uh, on uh, an event that the Lord Mayor, uh, Lord Mayor uh, raised um, uh, during his address, uh, and that was, of course, the uh, Gopio India Day affair, uh, affair uh, which uh, happened on uh, on August 17th um, at the uh, Rummer Street Parklands. Now, um, I'd just like to um, publicly thank the um, the Indian community and the Gopio organization for inviting me along. I hadn't been to one of these fairs in the Rummer Street Parklands. Um, what a what a fantastic venue that is. I hadn't been actually down in the uh, Parklands for a few years, and um, you know, obviously Brisbane City Councils, right across all administrations, have done a really terrific job in that space, and it's just amazing um, how how what, what the atmosphere is like down there, especially at the amphitheater. Um, I'd like to um, I'd like to thank uh, a, a few people from the uh, GoPO um, Go, uh, the GoPO uh, Queensland. Uh, immediate past president uh, Usha Chandra and, uh, and her husband Umesh Chandra, who was the MC on the day and did a uh, great job in keeping the program going because it was a, a reasonably long program um, uh, as far as uh, looking after the uh, invited uh, dignitaries and um, facil facilitating all the speeches that came, that came from those, uh, those uh, special guests. Um, the, Indian Day, uh, in, which is basically celebrates their uh, India's independence, of course, which is um, it's the second, 72nd year, I believe, uh, since 1947. Uh, and it's just really good to actually see a community, uh, first of all, celebrate a, uh, an Independence Day here in Australia. Uh, but also, they, this, this community, the Indian community, reaches out to many of the other cultural communities within, uh, within this place that we call Australia and uh, engage, engage them uh, in, uh, in what they, uh, what they how, engage them in their celebrations and also take part in celebrations of other um, cultural community events as well, um, which is very important. You know, we're, um, we're a melting pot here in Australia. Um, I know in, in my ward, um, some of my schools have over 47 or 50 um, uh, countries represented in some of those schools. Um, kids that have uh, either been uh, uh, migrated out from other countries and or were, were born to uh, parents uh, from those countries. Uh, but just, uh, I just want to, as I say, put it on the, on the record that uh, uh, my appreciation of being uh, invited along and, uh, and of course, such as, such as the respect that this community has that all levels of government were represented multiply. Uh, and uh, so uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers? There being none, I will. Oh, oh. Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I wasn't fast enough off the mark for you then. I rise to speak about Anzac Park in Tawong tonight, Chair. And I just want to give a little bit of background and also update you as to what's occurring there. So the park was established and named in 1916 and an avenue of honour commenced in July 1917, but we don't know where the original avenue of honour was. We know it was a line of trees, Chair, but there's no record, no map to show where it was. And in fact, newspaper collections uh, indicate there were actually five avenues of honour. And these avenues are just lines of trees and they were of different species of trees. Problem is, Anzac Park continues to change. It always has. The freeway dissected it and uh, split Anzac Park and made some of it Mount Cuthar Park. Who knows, the original avenue may have been under the freeway. The trees apparently died from a disease. Some of the palm trees died in the 60s. So we're not sure where it was. But I'm reliably informed by my good friend, Councillor Matic, that uh, back in 2010, under a program in the lead up to the centenary of the Anzacs, um, in 2010, a history research was undertaken into what was going on with the park, where the avenues of honour were, and so on. The idea was to make this Anzac Park befit the uh, stature and grandeur that it's entitled to. Strangely, it's not designated on the state register as a memorial park chair, but the locals love it, and I'll give uh, special mention to local resident Deanne Morrison, who is the fiercest advocate of this park I have met. I'm also very happy to work with the RSL President Kerry, and uh, I am a member of the Tuong RSL, so it's quite dear to me as well. And I'm pleased to say that the planting of a new avenue of honour is nearly complete. There are some flame trees going almost around the ring road of the park, and there'll be an arc of peace to signify the importance and the dedication of the nurses in World War I, and those flowers will bloom white, which is uh, fitting for the purity of the nurses, as they uh, indicated back in World War I. Um, but there is something particularly special that I want to say, and that is that I've been working with council officers for quite a few months now about this park, and due to the, the great work from the council officers, they have managed to source for me a descendant pine tree from the original lone pine at Gallipoli. And I have to go to Canberra to go and pick it up because that's, uh, it's a tree and doesn't come with a courier service. So I'm going to make a quick trip down there, pick it up, come back, and we're going to try and grow it on a little bit and then plant it at Anzac Park. And the uh, Lord Mayor will be coming to a commemoration ceremony on the 30th of October, I believe it is. And um, the local community will be given lots of encouragement to come along and celebrate that commemoration with us. But um, it is really important to acknowledge as, as well that a number of veterans had their ashes scattered through Anzac Park. Not legally, you're not supposed to go and spread ashes through a park, but that obviously means that it holds special memories for the people of the families of the people whose ashes were scattered there. So we are paying special homage to them and we're actually planting a second, lone, uh, a second pine tree opposite the lone pine, which will be a Norfolk pine, and we'll dedicate that to the people whose ashes were spread through the park. So Chair, I just wanted to update the chamber on the progress being made at Tawong's fantastic Anzac Park. Council officers have been working on this for a long, long time, making sure that the uh, Avenue of Honour can best represent and pay dedication to the original uh, avenues of honour. So thank you, thank you for hearing me. Further speakers? Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. I also rise to speak uh, about a local issue, but uh, uh, follows on from what Councillor Mackay has been speaking about, and that's the uh, rededication of the Avenue of Honours in Diggers Drive, Kalinga Park. As it happens, Councillor Mackay, and I'm happy to pass on to you this report that was undertaken, uh, which predicated uh, the, uh, the Diggers Drive rededication. Uh, there was a fantastic research report that was undertaken by council officers or on behalf of council officers uh, back in 2015, uh, commissioned by the National Environment and Sustainability Branch. 
the open space planning section of the council about the avenues of honours, uh, and they've identified 24 avenues of honours across in the Brisbane City Council area, the local government area, and, they, and as you said, Councillor Mackay, council officers have indeed been diligently uh, looking at the history of the avenues of honours and uh, what needs to be done to, to bring them up to speed in the current environment. The story of Diggers Drive um, in particular in Kalinga um, is a consequence of this report. Um, the tree plantings that were undertaken um, were a project undertaken by the Kalinga Unemployed and Distressed Soldiers Committee, and it was back in 1924, between March and May 1924. Um, trees planted were tallow woods, other eucalypts and cowrie pines. Um, I understand that in all some 83 former soldiers were employed uh, on tree planting, but also on road formation and drainage in Kalinga Park, which is one of the magnificent parks on the north side of the city. Um, the, the drive will be, uh, will, with the trees in place was officially opened in 1924, the 31st of May 1924, by Lieutenant Governor Sir Matthew Nathan. Unfortunately, the uh, original trees suffered, uh, have suffered at the hands of 21st century infrastructure and the timeless ravages and impacts of floods that uh, go through Kalinga Park. However, as Councillor Mackay has discovered and as I've seen over the last couple of years as well, uh, council officers, our arborists, have worked diligently to make sure that there are new tallowwood trees in particular going into this particular location to reflect the original plantings. Uh, there's a, some 107 tallow woods that have been replanted over the last couple of years. I'm pleased to say uh, they've all taken and they're now looking great. And tomorrow at three o'clock, we'll be rededicating those trees. They'll, the trees will be blessed uh, and we'll be rededicating those trees in situ down at uh, Diggers Drive. Everyone's welcome to attend. But uh, this is just another example, as Councillor Mackay has said, as, uh, as I've seen on the north side of the city, fantastic contribution by council arborists, by our news officers, by the officers in field services who contribute to the maintenance of these trees, and I thank them for their efforts, and I look forward to uh, rededicating, to assist in reded rededicating those trees, Diggers Drive, tomorrow afternoon. Further speakers? Thank you. Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I rise to speak tonight on um, community events across the city and also the Parkinson Aquatic Centre. Um, Mr Chairman, I've had the privilege this weekend just past to represent the Lord Mayor at Anzac Square for Vietnam Veterans Day. And I would like to place on record a very sincere thank you for your service to all of the Vietnam veterans out there. It is a privilege to be able to lay a wreath on behalf of the Lord Mayor um, and the city at uh, services such as this. And it is a reflection of the seriousness that we do um, respect those who serve, who have served and continue to serve. I'd also like to reflect on some of the uh, multicultural festivals that I've also had the privilege to represent Lord Mayor Adrian Schrenner at um, over the last week. And those have been organised in our city by students. And to the Singapore Students Association and the Indian, Indonesian Students Association, well done on your two <coughs> festivals that you have put on in King George Square, being the Singapore Independence Day and also Pesca Rakyat, which was held yesterday. Um, they, these students are wonderful examples of how young people can really pull together a very professional festival and celebrate their culture and share it with the wider community. So to each and every one of, you, of those students who've been involved, thank you for taking the time and effort out of your studies to really embrace not only our city, but to share your culture. I'd also like to extend to the Brisbane Nepalese women a very big thank you for including me in your Tiege Festival on Saturday night, to the Sri Lankan Sports Association of Queensland having me as your guest of honour last uh, week as well. It's, um, it's wonderful to see our multicultural community across the city being such a vibrant and active part of our day-to-day -day life. Now, in relation to Parkinson Aquatic Centre, I did stand up in this place last week and talk about the wonderful Leisure Facility of the Year Award that um, the Aquatic Centre was awarded two weeks ago. 
And now I am pleased to inform the Chamber that the Parkinson Aquatic Centre is set to become centre stage in a new movie which is scheduled to start filming this week um, for five days. Um, this actual um, movie will include both international stars and Australian current and former Olympic swimming champions. And it will certainly highlight that in our city of Brisbane, we have built a facility which is of a world-class international standard. And it's also hoped that by filming in Parkinson and bringing this film to our local community with the international levels of swimmers that will be um, arriving, this will provide um, more inspiration to our local swim squad, which has skyrocketed in membership from a couple of years ago having six swimmers to now having 135. So I would just like to convey to our lease operators and partners, City Venue Management, um, thank you for working with us on this. And I know the Deputy Mayor, um, Chris, Councillor Krista Adams, is very keen to see activities like this take place across our city. We've had quite a few mo um, recently. We've had an international film, Jiva, filmed in one of our parks. Now we've also got um, this one that's coming into our swimming facilities. So it is wonderful to have these opportunities, but also for the local residents who have the opportunity to be cast as extras and have cameo roles, I think that that's also wonderful. But it is a great promotion of our city. And most importantly, it really will sell this aquatic centre to the world in the lead up to the INAS Global Games because this aquatic centre not only leads the way with a focus of inclusion and access, especially as part of being a training facility for INAS Global Games, but it also demonstrates how a collaborative partnership between Brisbane City Council and City Venue Management has resulted in a sporting centre of excellence being delivered in the local community in the suburbs of Brisbane. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Shree. <clears throat> Thank you. I rise to speak on how big business is now running this city while the needs and interests of ordinary residents continue to be deprioritised and overlooked. On a regular basis, I hear from local residents who are frustrated because they feel like there is one rule for big developers and another rule for ordinary people. They see that on a regular basis, multinational corporations are given generous exemptions to neighbourhood plans and building codes, and meanwhile, Local communities can't even get funding for a zebra crossing or a, or a new park upgrade. This whole city is dollar signs. Price tags on every square centimetre. They build them higher now, right up to the boundaries. These clouds are made of concrete and steel. They never move. They never fade. Shadow streets and wind tunnels. Subdivide and conquer. Replacing lounge room windows with mirrors. The walls are getting higher. Intercom security, the walls are getting higher. We don't know our neighbours' names no more. Puppet masters dressed as real estate agents. Will my lease be renewed again? Will they jack up the rent again? And if you want your own apartment, it's a 25-year mortgage. Six months of your life for each square metre. Even the workers who build them can't afford to buy them. So where did all that money go? Where does all that money go? The public square is now leased out for profit. Neither trees nor musicians are tolerated unless they're good for business. The posh restaurant guards its footpath dining territorially, even when there aren't any other customers. We've got the money for a motorway, but not for public housing. There are laws against sleeping in the park, laws against dancing in the street. It's easier to get permits for advertising billboards than public art projects. They'd rather leave the walls grey. We've got no right to this city. You could rent here 20 years, put down roots, forge community, but it don't mean a thing when them wrecking balls swing. It's already been approved. It's already been approved. It's already been approved. There's nothing you can do. See, they want us to feel powerless. These towers just keep sprouting up from the bedrock. We've got jackhammers for alarm clocks, drowning in bitumen, choking on car fumes while their starting price is half a million dollars for two bedrooms. So who defines progress? Who really runs the system? 
They curse us and evict us like there's nothing we can do to stop them. Now them empty units are multiplying, but they still won't drop the rent. Vacant shops and silent streets, it's all just profit for the 1%. They can sterilise our culture, confiscate our megaphones, call us troublemakers just because we don't want a 30-year bank loan. We paint rainbows in the bitumen. They whitewash monochrome, but we're never going to stop fighting because this city is our home. This city is our home. I said, this city is our home. Then bankers price us out, but we leave footprints in the stone. Further speakers? There being none, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you, everybody.